But you know what? Let's focus on the game. It's finally ready to get underway. The countdown has completed, and we can get into game one of this best of seven between Kazva and Beastie. Spawning in on the left side, we're going to have Beastie playing as the Mongols in blue and Kasva whipping out the Delhi right at the beginning with the red. And he's going very heavy on the lumberjacking department, so straight away he's going to deviate from the usual build orders. Usually, see the players moving out for the berries at the beginning as a second scout to start with. So, we'll have to see how he plans to play this matchup. As he said, this is very, very important for the map control part. This matchup is going to be decided on whether or not Kasva can maintain that map control and leverage the sacred sites. Yeah, and that's what this wood play is all about for Kasva. He wants that initial influx of wood so he can actually afford his first military bonus straight away. He's preemptively setting himself up for a defensive situation he can hold against BC because, of course, you're up against Mongols. Mongols can very easily drop a military structure right at the beginning with the Uvu, double up production, and all of a sudden have you on the back foot. And that's the worst case scenario for Kasva. Like we are saying, when we go into this feudal age timing, when we think about between the 5 and 10 minute mark, Kasva needs to find a way to set pace. Otherwise, he can start to trail very hard, he can lose control of the map, and if you lose control of the midpoint of the map as a Delhi, you're essentially losing the game because those sacred sites are crucial to pushing forward against these high progressive sieves such as the Mongols, English, anything that is looking to pressure you in the first 15 minutes. Speaking of pressuring, Beastie is coming out of the barracks over here, which means that we're going to see some aggression coming up in Dark Age, and the same will be done here for Kazva. So we're going to have quite a lot of spearmen coming out here. Kazva spotting the barracks over here. At the beginning, of course, the Mongols' double training will be a lot more efficient than what the Delhi can do, because the Delhi first need to research efficient production to be able to match that level of production. They do, but one thing to keep in mind is whether BC will be able to like keep that influx of troops pushing out all times, right? Like resource allocation early on is something that we are only starting to learn more about with the Delhi and the Abbasids ever since they got that berry bush buff. So it's actually an insane buffer to their economy. It might even be you get to a scenario where you can support two military buildings before the Mongol player is capable of doing so. And also you'll find the additional value of using them later to wall up aggressively all over the place. And that, that's something I think we're gonna have to keep an eye on. I think this Berry Bush buff for Delhi was just an insane oversight out of the devs. And we might get treated to a perfect example of why in this series. Looking at Beasties coming out with the first two Spearmen as we speak, Kazva is just going to stand back to defend. He's going in for a Dark Age Mosque, which is the first big decision point to make. Sometimes you see the Delhi skipping that, but in open map scenarios, usually you go for it so you can start researching that efficient production as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact you want access to your, your text as quickly as possible, right? Because we said it's all going to be dragging out and feudal. So you're not thinking like, how do I quickly get to Castle of Kazva? I don't think Delhi ever thinking that. It's how do I quickly get into Feudal, and then how do I quickly secure the sites? So and this is going to be a little bit more omnipresent. A tower is coming wow. up here for Beastie. The Mongol Tower Rush was nerfed. You start with less wood, and the towers also cost more. And this is going to be very difficult to pull off for Beastie, because the Spearmen are coming out for Kazva. Yep. Beastie does have his spears to see as well, but Kaz is bringing this in. He has got two scouts and two spears, but it is, of course, the Mongol... Khan plus the two spears. So it's a little bit hard to actually kill Beastie off, but I think that's not what Kazva wants here. He just wants to deter him as we see. In fact, the spear might slowly but surely kill off the villager as he does move quicker. And of course, the Khan, kind of an irrelevant detail this stage, right? Two damage, whoop de doo The problem that you have is the further you run out, look what you run into. The double mass production means that Beastie now has the edge in terms of spear count, and you have to splinter and split in all directions. That's a beautiful move indeed from Beastie, and he's pulling under villagers, so he's not giving up on that tower rush just yet. Two more spearmen pop out, and that's a big hit on Kazva's scout. Kazva gets another hit on this scout, so almost losing that over there. But he spotted the next villager coming in, and he's slowing down his opponent's advance. Behind this one, he's got the power of the Delhi Berries as well. So his Fudiko is looking much better than his opponent's one. But for now, he's gonna have to keep adding spearmen, because there is no way that he's going to stop that tower without that. No, I mean, he's going to keep massing for the moment, but he's just waiting on that efficient production. It's going to take some time, because even after you get it, of course, like, you know, do you instantly just drop your scholar and switch him over? Probably, but, like, I think you might end up in a situation where you're considering, like, a second Rax at some point here, because it might be a little bit too greedy to just rush up and try to get your archers online. The problem is, if you go double Rax, it's going to make it very easy for Beastie to cruise through to an archer army quicker than you. However, we're thinking of the future. You need to deal with it now. The outpost is being constructed. Two villagers here this time. A lot of spearmen, however, from Kazva, even rushing out the villages, that should deter and scare Beastie away. So it looks like, once again, it's going to be a failed attempt for Beastie to get this outpost down, but he will renew the effort. 
I love the move to pull the villagers here. Even the scholar is being pulled to heal, and in such a yeah. battle where the numbers are just locking for Kasva, being able to heal those spears is immensely powerful, especially because the opponent has relatively low damage output units, so that healing power is actually quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you're really missing out much. Most of the military efficiency research tick had already been done. You don't really need anything else. So this is the best use of the Scholar. It's just giving you better bang for buck. It's actually an impressive detail that maybe gets overlooked a lot. Something, oh, mo well, if you lose him, it's not going to be good. Luckily, 90 health is enough to keep him healthy against 6 damage per poke. And the outpost is being constructed a little bit further back, but this one from BC should be successful. I don't think Kazu can stop this in time. He's going to rush forward. Maybe he can punish the villagers, but he needs to get on top of them right now and stab through. However, outpost is going to be complete, and they will garrison before he can kill off even one villager. And that means Kazu has to back away. And that is worrying. Because although it is not an outpost directly close to your eco lines, it is the beginning of a tumor that will grow quickly. Indeed, and now, once Beastie gets to Feudal Age, he's gonna have the Yam Speed Network boosting his units nearby, so he's got a perfect staging ground. Getting up a second tower is gonna be difficult, but the target is clear, he wants to hit the berries, and soon Kazu will have to fight this one. Yep, and Beastie is almost ready for a tech up. The only thing he's missing right now is gold. He needs to get some people across on there, he's finally shifted them out, so he'll be prepped and ready in the next minute. Well, Kazva is looking a little bit stuck. He continues to push out the Spearman, but the problem is... This, this becomes a very cost-inefficient selection up against BC at this stage, but you don't have any other options, right? If you tech up, you're going to lose the game. You have to address this outpost right now. You're going to force the villagers back once more, but the count right now just doesn't look that good. It's even, and with BC also having the Khan, he will have the edge here, even on the home front of Kazva. Pokes out, damage being done, but it looks like BC is going to peel away for the moment, and every time you peel away, it is an opportunity for that Scholar to start healing, but the Scholar isn't there because he needs to stick inside that Rax and make sure you're pushing out ample Spearmen at all times. And while the production is there for Kasva, the problem is the efficiency in terms of resources invested. Because every time you see those double Spearmen being trained, you get two Spearmen for a price of one. Whereas for Kasva, he has to invest full price. And that's the reason why Kasva can't afford Fuel Age yet, whereas his opponent is already on the way up. He simply is just spending way more resources on those units. So regardless of the fact that he's got the berries working for him, he's just spending a lot more resources. And I love that tower from Beastie. That's going to set up the stage for the next tower to be placed. And Kasva sees it, but he hasn't pulled the Spearman just yet to fight it. Uh, it. It's hard because there's too many Spears here still. The garrison in the outpost nearby, you come near it, you're going to be under fire. And that's the problem. He kind of has to just run. This almost is reaching an all-in point where you don't have a choice anymore. Villager's going to be garrisoned, so Beastie doesn't sacrifice any of them. Spearman will now turn around and deal with the outpost. But how many are going to die for this? The good news is because Beastie stemmed his production due to the fact he was taking up, he is outnumbered now. So it might be that Kazva gets rid of this, but it means that Kazva is going to be stuck in the Feudal Age while Beastie will be up teched above him as he's almost complete now with the Deer Stun. And that is where just adding a couple of archers here could be devastating. Kazva has absolutely no tools to stop archers and you're going to have a defensive tower trying to stop that one. I get the feel that this tower will go up, or Beastie, before that defensive tower is finished. And another tower coming up on the Vood line of Kazva. This is something that he oh, sees and he could likely stop. But he's slowly getting yeah. suffocated here from multiple directions. But look what happens. Look what happens because of this. The rush in. He says, okay, if you're going to count on me out on the north side, I'm going to push you back here. Moves in and look at the instant damage done by the raiding of Beastie onto this outpost. It will die in the blink of an eye. And you have five helpless villagers waiting to just flood out of there into the arms. The waiting arms of Beastie Spears. He gets 50 resource for his trouble. Burns down the outpost. It's 100 wood wasted by Kazva. And Beastie can now easily back away because he has that yam movement speed to juice him up. Also grabbing Hardened Spearman here, so now he has the advantage and the quality of units jumps into the tower and he's going to deliver a couple of arrows on those spears. The only oh, good is... news for Kasva really is that he killed the four villagers, but at this point Beastie could just pull more. Arrow slits are coming in and as you said, every single building burned down over here by Beastie is just an extra level of resources added. This was nerfed, it's not 50-50 anymore, it's only 25-25, but this early in yeah. the game, 25 food and 25 gold is nothing to be ashamed of. Exactly. So it's 50 resources, right, for a, a structure your opponent invested 100 resources in. So that's 150 differential. That's the way you have to think about this. I think a lot of people kind of get locked up. It's like, oh, it's only 25 each. Yeah. But what did your opponent pay for that? And what did you remove now from the effective, like, eco gain in the early game? Right? And every time you do this, it's very effective. Like, even on this, these houses, right, these houses that should, like, 50 wood, well, you also get 50 resources. So once again, it's 100 resource differential in your favor. I think my big issue, the way that Kazza played this open, is 
this, right? Look what he's done now with this wall. Why was this not done sooner? I think if he'd done this on the west side as well, it would have stunned and delayed. And he could have done it because remember, he's playing as the Delhi and they have the ability to build palisades with their spearmen. He could have easily moved out, quick walled up, and he would have stunned the, this move by Beastie so that it wasn't threatening onto his berry line and he'd still be able to be gathering there right now. He's coming in with the hardened spearman as his berry villagers on the right side are heavily exposed. He ran out of oh. sheep underneath the town center, so he has to move out, but he just can't protect those uh, berries right now. No, and, and even when he has the number advantage, he doesn't want to take this fight, right? Because if you look at the racks right now, he's just trying to get the upgrade for the hardened spearman. Of course, that takes a little bit longer because while it's free, techs are longer for Delhi. That's the way they're balanced. It means that you're just kind of stuck in this balance check where you can't actually aggress and push BC away. He just gets to chill on the outside of your base and pressure you constantly, forcing you away from your valuable eco lines. Speaking of pressuring, uh, though, Beastie is not bringing in archers here as we have a bit of a miss micro with those spears. Not exactly sure what happened, maybe a misclick or what. And the tower now is also exposed, so Beastie's gonna have to pull the villagers back. He didn't add I a single that, archer. I think that Spearman's just like next level brain. He's like, why would I burn something down when I can just walk around it? Well, that's exactly <laughs> why, because there's a million and one spears waiting for you on the other side. But yeah, walls are gonna be pulled down in the end. The problem is with the tech up now done, Kazva kind of has some wiggle room to get back in this. Yes, he's still pressured, but there's a lot of space to shift to to the back of his base. He just needs to make sure he doesn't lose control of this east side and this berry bush line, and then he should be fine for the next five minutes. Although uh, I, I say he should be fine, I guess. This is if tricky. you want to be ignorant and not look at Beastie's eco numbers, then you could say it'll be fine. My concern is Beastie's about to be teched up in the next two minutes. Yeah, that is the big thing over here because oftentimes this is what you do with the um, Mongols. You just go for sort of a Dark Age pressure into a semi-fast castle approach because while your opponent is defending against your Dark Age opening, you can just bank up the resources for Castle Age. There is some risk involved with this because, of course, this leaves a bit of a room for Kasva to recover. If you just uh, amped up the pressure with a couple of archers, I don't know how Kasva would have been able to stop it. But now Kasva has to play full Feudal Age. At least, this gives a window for Kasva, though we have seen it in multiple cases yesterday, that if you go up to Castle Age but you can't protect your gold mine, you are done because all the units that you want to go for, Men at Arms and Lancers, they rely on gold, and that gold mine is dangerously exposed. So if Kaz was able to clean up this forward and then push forward before his opponent gets the power units out, there's a chance to deny the gold from his opponent. Yeah, I think the important thing here is if BC wants to keep up the pressure, he needs to keep these outposts alive. But this is a good move by Kazza. You see he shifts out with the spearman, he burns them all down. The importance of this cannot be stated enough. Because if they are up when Castle arrives for Beastie, he'll move quickly across the map, he'll out maneuver you in your own base due to the yam movement speed and even something like mana arms could crush you in the blink of the eyes and that that's the problem that kazva has right if he didn't get rid of these outposts mana arms ends his game here he only has archers and spearmen no clear counter to the maa but now because that network is not going to be there he doesn't have to worry about this super dynamic very fast mana arms running down his troops instead it might be that beastie just plays into something a bit more easy to counter such as the lancers but now well, beastie has triple barracks added be but not a single man at arms coming in, and as I said, there's a window here for Kazva to do damage, and Beastie knows that he's scrambling for a defensive tower as we speak. He's a little bit late though. Only a few archers here, the spearmen are more problematic, the ammo loves to move away, they're gonna continue the construction, means he's gonna sacrifice a few of these villagers though. And he'll garrison what he can, back off the rest of them here. Spears are going to be depleted, but the Mana Arms are almost being pushed out in double mass through to the racks. So that will instantly, in the blink of the eye, be five Mana Arms ready to repel this force. And honestly, five Mana Arms against 16 of these types of troops easily win for the MAA. Yeah, it is an easy that. win out there. For Kazma, this is just a little too late over here. He's going to burn down this tower potentially, and I guess he's trying to finish it off to prevent the villagers from repairing. Speaking of whom, the villagers jump out and trying to repair this. Archers at least will be able to retaliate against the Vils, so there is a couple of villagers killed at least for Kazva. He's trickling in just non-stop units, but I'm not sure if he can really fight off that many man arms And the man arms aren't particularly gold heavy, so you can get like 15-20 of them out before you really need to start worrying about that gold mine. And I think Kazva has a different intent here. This should be the Sacred Sites play, right? Like, he should start pushing out the Scholars and moving towards those because now he's just kind of churning out these units to keep his opponent at his base. If he continues this and gets mid-map control, he'll be able to reach a quick tech up time himself. He'll be able to stabilize quite effectively. As it stands, he needs to keep that pressure, though. If at any stage he lets off the brakes and Beastie gets a little bit of chill time to fully realize the power of his castle, this game will end in the next two minutes. So really critical that you just essentially body your opponent. Throw out this disposable unit 
count of archers and spearmen and never look back, knowing that in a few minutes time, having two of these sacred sites will generate so much gold for you that you might be able to actually compete with the powerhouse that is the step readout. 100%. The convo is very effective picking off a couple of villagers from Kazva, so ultimately it's 41-41 on the villager department. Despite the fact that Kazva was able to kill quite a few forward villagers and gold miners, he just lost quite a lot of his own because of that con was there. The con is getting a massive power going. spike in Castle Age, up to 12 damage by default. It's absurd, and you can see that it's being offset a little bit by the fact Kazva did go for textiles, but he's still feeling the pain nonetheless. On the other side, I don't think Beastie did he? No, he ignored it entirely because he wasn't really expecting this pressure, and he still won't get textiles. In the meantime, the archer count has become problematic. The archer sniping out the villagers successfully. Beastie needs to be very careful about this. This is the weakness of the MAA. Even with that juiced up movement speed, unless they get in charge range, these archers can somewhat disengage. And once you move out of range of these outposts, which are very finite at this stage in the game, it's very hard to just maintain control and chase down onto this archer count that Kazza still has. Beastie was able to finish that Ohu in the last second before the archers arrived. It would have been an absolute brutality if that uh, Ohu was denied by the archers because he needs that stone trickle to produce the double men at arms. Otherwise, they're still very expensive. For a player that is only sitting at 41 villagers, up north, sacred site being captured, men at arms are being sent around. But as you said, the problem with the men at arms here is lack of mobility. And you get the feel that Kazva is doing an exceptional job just pinning his opponent inside his base. And with that, just giving himself a window to take the hunt on the south or just start capping the sacred sites. Exactly. You can see it in the back of the base right now, right? These guys have put on too much armor. They can't quite move. <laughs> They're just being duped out constantly by the archers. And oh, Kazva. Did he spot this? I think he didn't see it. That was a smart move. BC shifted the monastery and the old man away just in time. So his opponent doesn't actually know that he's gone for a monastery. He won't know that there's going to be a play towards relics. That would have been something that Kazwa could have exploited. He could have stationed around them. Because, of course, one big issue with these man of arms, once again, is they're so slow. It means the archers can outmaneuver them and then snipe down these poor old men with their sticks. By the way, this is actually a very clever trick that you can use with the Mongols. You can pick up the relics, garrison them into the prayer tent, and then pick up the prayer tent and move on. So it's basically that traveling shop of relics. It's a very, very clever thing to do. I've seen this done against HRE. So what you do is just pick the relic up, garrison it into the prayer tent, and just move up again. And it's very difficult to stop this one because you don't have to walk back with your shaman to pick up the relics and bring it them back. so silly. <laughs> well, Archer's trying to get rid of this Shaman. They'll at least punish him as Beastie oh. didn't even bother to bank the Relic. I think uh, maybe the old man done his back out when he picked that one up. And as a result, he's going to have to replace that poor old Shaman. He'd be happy to do so, though, because he's already getting that gold trickle due to having won those Relics banked. And more Archers in the center. Kazva finally looking to tech up, and it is going to be a compound of the Defender play. Now, this is risky because you could be up against Lancers, and you will continue to be up against his man and arms game goes on. He could have tried to go for the Home Blades and then essentially outplay his opponent, but instead he's concerned that he's going to need to static defend around the Sacred Sites. And now the Maganel play is coming out from BC on the Archers. Kazva doesn't look. Aww. Instantly checks back and sees, wait, uh, hold on a sec, I'm missing half my army. What happens? Well, it turns out that giant boulders falling from the skies are quite the uh, the counter to anything squishy in the Feudal Age. I'm fairly certain he was looking at these archers harassing the gold mine of the opponent, and to be fair, he is doing quite a lot of damage with those archers, given the circumstances, but as you said, he just lost a tremendous amount of archers, and mm -hmm. as you said, compound of defender oh. in for him. That actually could be a saving grace. Well, you say that. There's a bigger landmark issue occurring. You're seeing it roll across the map right now. Beastie is getting aggressive at the Deerstone because Deerstones aren't even backing your base anymore. It serves no relevance. Replace it with an outpost and use it as an aggressive staging point for these mana arms that are usually too slow to do anything. All of a sudden, this game gets very dangerous for Kazva. And because he just teched up, he's shown his, ex his exposed side, right? He's actually admitted, I am missing 1,800 resources of defense right now. And that is something that Beastie is going to exploit. Mangonels, decent at sieging, will start to get through the buildings. Remember, every one of these burn is additional resources. And with the man arms having so much armor, they can easily dive in, deal with the outpost, and then go even deeper. And Kazva has no troops here to defend himself because he was trying to prep for a later time and because he just done this tech up. He's going to have a couple of crossbows hitting the field very soon to clean up some of the men at arms, but there is just no answer to those Mangonels right now. And Mongols being able to build those siege weapons out there is going to be immensely helpful. Behind this one, the Shaman is still collecting the relics, and... It shouldn't be underestimated that uh, Beast is going to have so much passive gold income from those relics. And he's just slowly suffocating his opponent, who is unable to access those sacred sites. Gazwa is scrambling for stone. He's got 30 villagers on stone out there. He just wants to get some stone walls up, place a couple of towers, and hope that he can hold out a little longer, drag this game out.
This is like one of those traveling preachers, oh, no. right? Like he shows up oh, with no. one of those RVs, he converts you and... Oh no, oh. the villagers! Oh, what? What? <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Kazwa? Where are they going? Castle drop. Uh, uh, it's a castle drop. Look at the gold mine of oh, Freezy. This is oh a classic AoE 2 god. approach. Oh, uh, it's the this... desperation castle. But it... But he got spotted as well, so it's not even going to feel big brain. I mean, you say that, he's not even gathering stone anymore. Okay, oh, sorry, I see now. Yeah, 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 I didn't see the highlight. So he's already got the keep. But this keep doesn't really deny anything. Now they're yeah. doing nothing. Oh, my God. Uh, Kazma. All right, and hide. This is like the Rust campaign. Hide in the trees. We'll find you later. But I don't think anything but death is going to find you. Kazma with the all-in gambit realizes it's a futile effort. And BC, as expected, will dominate with the Mongols to open this up on Dry Arabia. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> what a game. I mean, I understand the idea. This is something that, you know, you do very frequently in AoE 2. And Kazma's got the AoE 2 background. That, you know, it's desperation time, so you're trying to swing the battle back in your favor by just dropping a castle in the opponent's face and then suddenly just crippling the eco. But, you know, the Mongols' eco of beast is just so spread out. And as you said, that was a nearly depleted gold mine. So really, even if it goes up, it wouldn't have denied much. <laughs> but, of course, the story of this game is that discrepancy in the castleage times and the way that beast could deny those sacred sites from his opponent by just maintaining that pressure. And really, by the time Kasva got out of his base, it was too late. The men at arms arrived, and there was just no answer to those. By the time Kasva gets up to Castle H to get some crossbows going, it was just too late. And now he is going to lose his uh, Mongols, and Kasva's going yep. to lose the Delhi. And that's the more concerning thing, I think, at this point, because we've talked about this. You use Delhi over here, which is a somewhat risky approach. And you've done a very risky kind of play in that that castle there. Like that, that was the crazy yep. part. Actually. I was looking around for ways dropping that castle because not like it doesn't make sense near that step readout we talked about. Like it needs to be a bit more aggressive. And I feel like that kind of like that that states in a good way the, the nature of the game. I feel like everything was kind of totally in defensive, and you felt like to an extent Kaz was doing a good job of holding. But I think the detail comes back to in that game one is the reluctance to wall. Like, one of the biggest strengths of Delhi in these open maps is the fact that they can wall efficiently without risking any of their economy, right? Their villagers don't have to go do it. That's the thing. BC is bringing forward these, these uh, villagers to invest in this early game strategy of dropping outposts. Well, you can block that off with Palisades very easily. You can stunt the movement, the growth, the, the, the whole kind of tumor nature of the outpost spam just by moving out a few spearmen walling up these gaps, and then doubling the time it takes BC to move around. I think that gives a lot more wiggle room. And as a result, as you said, because now you don't have Delhi available, because maybe you don't fully utilize them the way that they can actually be so beautifully effective on an open map with the walling, all of a sudden now you're going to be missing that strategic element to the overarching series of like Delhi coming out on a war hybrid map or Delhi coming out on one of these more easily defendable and acquirable um, sacred site type maps. And while you do still have the Mongols, we talked about the fact that like you're going to have to be very select about when you pick the Mongols because there's only a few maps left that they feels good on. And that's something that BC is going to be wise to because as we highlighted, he's a Mongol specialist. He played the crap out of this when it first came out. He's probably already got a list in his mind of what's best and what's worst of the remaining maps. And he's probably going to anticipate when you try and whip them out yourself. Now we do have a Daniel River game up, but this is going to be short-lived because it very much seems like there was either a game crash or an admin restart. We'll have to check for that, because uh, the reality is that the game ends after one and a half minutes. In fact, the spec countdown even didn't go to the completion, so uh, it's 100% going to be crashed. So I'm trying to look for the reasons why this could be an admin restart, if it is. Because it's possible it's just a crash or a disconnect, but it's also possible it's an admin restart. But I don't see any reason that would warrant an admin restart over here. So I guess our talking point is going to be, instead of what exactly happened in this game that is just basically going to be restarted is the fact that we're going to have Holy Roman Empire mirrors on Danube River. So wait, it's Holy Roman Empire mirrored. Wow. Okay. So this is, this is an interesting one. I've seen this match up a few times. Um, and outside of like the obvious, we like knights on both sides. I have seen some players hard commit into feudal understanding that like, although your HRE is well, one of the big weaknesses is HRE doesn't really want to play in Feudal. They just want to, like, you know, dip the toe around it and then instantly up into Castle. And that's something that might be exploitable. One thing I might 
uh, be interested to see here that could be quite effective again is just actually whipping out a villager early on and dropping outposts on your opponent's side. I think it's heavily underrated up against the HRE. HRE, despite the fact that a lot of their uh, eco efficiency comes on land, they want to play river, right? Even after the nerfs, I'd say they still want to play river because it's just a big boost of their food eco. So these type of small differences uh, really could just actually set everything in motion. It's a little bit more gambity. It's something I might expect to see more out of Beastie than uh, maybe seeing out of Kazran in this mirror matchup being one point up and also just the nature of these players i think kasva tends to just try and play towards his strongest timings he's very good at, at actually efficiently reaching them right but like he doesn't tend to like get out of line as much as other players this is something very different with beastie beastie over the last few weeks especially has really evolved his game when he first started playing he was a very defensive player like a lot of people were but in more recent times we've seen these more kind of gambity all-ins like obviously this outpost play is an example of that but i think the outpost spam is kind of you know a given for mongols like whoop to do in general though when you give beastie any number of different sieves he looks for a way in which he can maybe close the game in feudal he's not even thinking castle imperial like a lot of players still do when they're whipping out these very greedy sieves such as the HRE. Looking at the civilizations though, indeed, HRE mirrors on Daniel Braver just tells me one thing. Demolition ships. Yeah. Because one of the things that we're seeing frequently from the Holy Roman Empire, if they get selected here, is some sort of semi-fast imperial play to a certain extent because these rivers are fairly well defendable. You can void yourself off... So early aggression might not yield massive results for either side. So it's more about those proxy warfare for the relics. But after that, it's sort of a race to Imperial for the pass of Schwabia. In an HRE mirror, being able to get to Imperial slightly faster and just produce 20 more villagers than your opponent from the pass of Schwabia early on is a tremendous advantage. And of course, once you get to Imperial, you can get the explosives upgrade for your demolition ships, making them just a lot better than they used to be. Yes, most definitely. I mean, it's kind of a given opportunity, right? Demo ships are still mind-bogglingly, ridiculously broken. Uh, but, like, my, my highlightable point in this game would be that BC is a very exploitative type player. He likes to play fast. I think he will prioritize scouting early on. If he sees that Kazra isn't appropriately defending himself, i.e. doing things such as uh, walling off his own forward, you just might see BC play into an ultra-aggressive early game comp where he rushes in and beats you down before you even reach Castle. I've seen a bunch of HRE players do it. It's very scary. There's actually some really kind of weird niche strategies as well. Horseman is a surprisingly effective pivot for HRE. Your economy is so effective early on, you're actually able to invest in it. And usually you do it against opponents that have heavily invested on the waterfront at an early point. We're talking like two docks already before Castle. You can easily push across, raise that to the ground, and then rush into the main base if they haven't walled that crossing. And I've seen a lot of players more recently, almost like an obsession of min-maxing what they're getting out of their villages, refusing to just take that one villager who has built a dock and move him across and wall across the, the area to keep them safe. And I think it's very easy to fail to do that when you're in a matchup like this, where your expectation of your opponent is that they are going to do what you are doing, which is being very greedy and min-maxing and not having a military force. So we'll have to wait to get into that. I believe we're just three minutes away from this one. If anyone just tuning in, by the way, Beastie did take game one with the Mongols. He uh, beat Kazva's Delhi, which means that those are both eliminated. Now we're getting back to the mirror matchup. This is kind of that balance I talked about in the overarching series where if we didn't see a mirror matchup in the first two games, everything was going to get wild quickly. But this is, kind of gives a stabilization point. And it's interesting that they whip these out on uh, Danny River, and nobody thought about taking the Delhi, which even after the nerfs is still fairly strong about around these these kind of river formats. But I imagine the the kind of thought process for Beastie is maybe with like I think Mongolian Heights is one of the maps chosen, right? Maybe he thinks about whipping Delhi out further down the line around that area. It's indeed a possibility. Um, at some point, I would expect those Mongols to be popped on a hybrid map for Kasva, given the fact that he already surrendered his Delhi. Um, mm -hmm. So, yep. Yeah, um, there's just so much still to like figure out. I mean, I'm gonna like uh, your your stream handily has them all, so I can kind of think this this out more deeply. King of the Hill, King of the Hill actually might be the map where Beastie pulls out Delhi. I think that's the one he's waiting for. Like even with everyone focusing on Home Blades again, he makes it even more powerful that people aren't in the forefront of their mind thinking, oh, actually, Compound of the Defenders is still really broken. And King of the Hill is the number one map for exactly that. So we might get treated to that a little bit further down the line. But, you know, let's fix out on this because one important detail when we talk about Danny River is the, the positioning, right? The positioning of both of these players. One person is going to be centralized. The other one is going to be off to the side. The centralized player 
um, in this matchup, if you're playing Ultra, Eco, and Greedy, is going to be more exposed. Whereas the one retracted in the corner with the HRE, HRE matchup is a lot harder to assault. So it's going to be interesting to see if that plays into the the kind of idea of one of them rushing and one of them being defensive or if they are just both going to play that very kind of tedious very yawn let's see who makes it to imperial first which i'm not i'm not actually believing that they're going to do this because i feel like it's very much whenever you make that decision to just play hard into imperial rush you're kind of just gambling on the map seed more than anything else so unless you get a very big clear indicator of you having a better generation start you don't really want to leave it down to what almost feels like chance more than skill right Yep, indeed. Just as a reminder, the reason why we're still waiting over here is because while game number two started, it ended up being a restart, and whenever you restart the game, we'll have to wait for a five-minute spectator delay once again. So, yes, in theory, we had a game up for a solid one minute, and after that, they decided to restart this. I haven't received any official info on why, um, but why it's possible... Why didn't you ask that, Lytical? Why, why, why don't you know everything? Huh? <laughs> We, oh, that could have been an amazing game for we know. There could have been, like, you know what could have happened? They could have got in. One of them could have accidentally held the delete key. And that technically counted. And this is the third game. We don't know. All because we weren't in that game, Lytical. I was. I was in that game. Um, I was in that game for a solid minute. Okay, but anyways... Did anyone hit the delete key? <laughs> anyways, it is five seconds left to go. I'm being told that the map seed was bad, which is um, definitely a possibility. Uh, although I thought that they used picked seeds for the final rounds, but it is what it is. Welcome to game number two. After the long wait, we will have Beastie playing as the blue HRE on the south. And to the north, it's also the Holy Roman Empire in the hands of uh, Kasva in red. Uh, I'm told that there was no fish in the previous seed. This one has what? a... Well, actually, actually, this one has quite a lot. This one has quite a lot. Um, Kazwa doesn't have a ton on his side, though. So, strictly really? speaking, like if you look at Kazwa's side, his own side of the river actually doesn't have any fish. Like, obviously, um, the other shoreline has it, but oh, if you compare yeah. it to what Beastie has, it's just a ton more fish. Like, I can select about nine, ten droplets in just one screen, whereas for Kazwa. Probably three or four at maximum. Obviously, if he moves out a little more, he could access more fish. But strictly speaking, so, I, I was just gonna say, like after I done the count, I think it's like about a six fish point lead for Beastie. Um, we'll, we'll see if they care too much. I think like Hazard's not gonna be phased too much, just because I think the the wood generation is what triggers this change in behavior on the spawn of fish. So because you have this wood line right here uh, next to his base, next to the shore. That essentially blocks out the spawn points for the fish. Um, and then outside that, I don't know if you care too much about the southern side because you're going to place a dock here anyway, right? So, so maybe he just plays with this generation. Everything else is really good, actually. I have to say that, that, that this remake has benefited Kazva because if you look at his land format, he's got berry bush, gold, deer, and wood all in range of an Arkham Chapel drop. This is the dream. Speaking of the dream, he's trying to stop that dock as well with the scout, but without animation cancelling, that is not going to be a possibility. He can damage the villager, but that's all that he can accomplish. Kazva dropping his own dock in the right-hand side corner, that's actually a pretty nice spot for him. There's six droplets of fish, and as you said, one of the things that's actually appealing for Kazva's base layout is that it's fairly well defendable. The two forests are nicely spread out. As we have a second scout coming in here for Beastie, trying to kill that scout over there. Kazva committing against the villager, and he actually... Oh. Oh no, it, it looked oh. like he might for a moment get between them, but he's not able to. He will lose the villager in the uh, end. Yeah, and after that, it seemed like Kasper would just get away with the kill. He killed the villager and he was about to run away, but Gbisti ends up killing the scout. One scout trade to one villager here is a pretty decent trade, I would say, for Kasper, although we have to keep in mind that adding a new scout now for Kasper would actually cost 70 food as compared to just adding a new villager for 50. But of course, having one less worker for the opponent is definitely something to be disappointed about. Both players have a very nice positioning of the Prelate, boosting their villagers on sheep and their lumberjacks as well. Exactly. And on top of that, like we said, you know, we talked about how great Kazva's generation is. This is just absurd, in my opinion. Uh, when you look at Beasties, it's not the same. Beasties is pretty bad. He can boost a deer line and two wood points. That's the best he can achieve. He can't get his gold involved in that. He can't have a berry bush as well. It, it's honestly, he's got like half the value. It's it's pretty frustrating. Like if you look back at this game afterwards, you're BC. 
yeah, the droplets of fish is a bit annoying from Casper's perspective, but like overall, everything feels really good about this. You get the defensive hold-in point because you're the person in the corner, which means you can easily just be more greedy. And everything around you says, be greedy, Casper. Go on, just go for the castle. Go be Imperial. And there's not much <laughs> to kind of compel him to do like anything else, right? Like, why would you think about needing to be aggressive? If anything, Beastie, I think he scouted most of this out. Yeah, he gets around the back, he sees the layout of this map, and he might feel a little bit obliged to get aggressive as a result, because otherwise your opponent could very easily cruise through to Imperial vastly ahead of you because everything is just so condensed. It is so well defendable. Indeed, he actually dropped the tiny bit of Palisade right next to that dock, which makes it very safe as well. So he really doesn't have to be afraid of a ton of land aggression simply because his base is so well defendable. He also won the Sheep Wars over here by a massive margin. He has managed to get 11 Sheep, whereas if you look at Beast's side, he's almost out of Sheep already. Now, of course, most of your food eco will come from the fishing, but being able to have some Sheep as a fallback option in case your fishing eco gets pressured is always a nice thing. So this start is light years better at this point for Kasva. As you said, the base layout is better. Being able to secure more sheep is also pretty nice. He picked off one villager from the opponent. Everything seems to be great at this point for Kasva. Yeah, and notice that that detail that I like to note out about. Kasva moves his sheep to the right side. Once again, just min-maxing the, the distance that old man has to walk. You know, if he's only got a few years left on the planet, might as well not spend it all walking around. And that means that he's getting more of these villages buffed up because he's got this kind of nice like holy triangle of minimized walk speed, uh, distance rather, between the gold line, wood line, and food. When you look at the other side, Beastie essentially was neglecting his gold line because it was just so far out. The only reason he switched across now is because he's running low on gold and he has everything else sorted. So originally he was just having these people, uh, this prelate rather, run back and forth between the sheep and the wood and was completely ignoring the gold because it's just so far out in no man's land. Beast is already on the way to Feudal Age here, five villagers building the Akin Chapel. It is going to affect the Hunt and the Lumberjacks, but as I said, there is no way for him to also boost his gold miners. He is cross walling the river right now, whereas on the other side, Castle delayed the Akin Chapel quite considerably, also only building it at four. So he's going to have a slightly slower Feudal Age here, partly because he added two more scouts. So he lost one scout and he still has two on the battlefield. Part of the reason why he was able to secure so much sheep and also simultaneously pick up a villager. I think this is also about him keeping eyeballs on what's happening everywhere, right? Like, like obviously it's in the name, scouting for scouts, but in this matchup, what we were highlighting, right, is if one player sees that they are behind from a generation perspective, they might be inclined to get aggressive. And I think Kazva understands that he's got the golden ticket. There's no way in hell anyone got a better generation than he did, because this is probably one of the best generations I've ever seen an HRE player get here on, uh, on Danube to open up. We can talk about the idea of the relics maybe not being the most favorable and being actually, in fairness, quite balanced in this, this generation. But in terms of like your first 10, 15 minutes, this is the best HRE generation I've ever seen. Feudal Age is in here for Beast. He's actually going to start taking the hunt over there without the mill. Although he's just shooting all the deer. Makes me wonder why. He probably wants to just locate that mill in between those deer carcasses, which is something that you sometimes do. Just kill the deer preemptively and then place the mill, so it's effective. But, of course, most of his food eco will still come from the fishing department, and he did add a second product to boost the gold miner, something that you commonly see when you have your resources spread out like that. The good news for Kazwa is that he doesn't have to add that second prelate himself, because his entire eco is boosted by the uh, Arkin Chapel, and he pulls all the lumberjacks to gold, so Kazwa wants to rush that castle age as much as possible. He really is just churning out 17 gold miners. Beast is going to spot that, but how do you even stop this? By the time Beast could do anything against this one, Kasva's gotta be in castle. Yeah, you're just too far away. And I think Beastie originally was weighing up, do I want to be aggressive and feudal? But you realize, like, not only is it the window is small uh, to try and exploit an HRE player doing this, it's the fact that when you actually look at the layout, it's not just that this is an amazing layout in terms of resource. How do you get in? Like, how do you actually punish Kasva here? Right, because he's got this defendable point near the goal line. Then at the back, it's a small area to move through, which can quickly be walled. You can't go to the east due to that natural defense line of the wood with the small palisade. So overall, BC doesn't actually have any option but to just try and race to Castle, maybe even Imperial, and probably be behind because Kazza got the better start. And you can see it already. Kazza, he does drop the Regnus Cathedral. Beastie is lining this up really nicely, though. He's barely behind his opponent at this stage. In fact, already prepping the villagers and moving them out, them out to drop the Regnus Cathedral. I love the way that Kazva is using those uh, prelates though. There is an extra movement speed now in the new patch and he's leveraging that. He's moving out for like number one, two. 
There is a couple of wolves and scouts harassing him though, and honestly the wolves are a little more annoying than those scouts are. Kazva had two scouts himself, so he could actually fight this one. And he, Kazva, I think, added a third prelate as well, so he was very active adding new prelates just so that he can secure those relics. He knows the importance of this relic race here, and he heals up his own scout in this battle. I get the feel that Beastie isn't gonna be able to kill that prelate, but you gotta keep in mind, the wolves are also dangerous here. And, yeah, okay, now Castle comes in. they're working for Beastie. They're all working for Beastie. The wall all play. Beastie. Uh, oh, he gets nope. out, but the wolf is gonna finish him off. Oh, man. I mean... Is it not kind of fitting? The guy with the name Beastie has the assistance of the beasts here. He seems to have tamed them because the wolves are working all for him and completely against Kazva. So he will deny that relic being dragged away to the base. On the other side, we can actually see Kazva is going to have his second prelate chased after by this scout as well. And the prelate won't keep pursuit. And it looks like he's going to accept that this relic is at least going home. He needs to actually just fixate around the remaining three relics that he can steal as the blue Atari player pick up. But it looks like he's not going to get that either. Kazva quick out with another prelate into the center. We'll be able to take the central island relic. And that means that BC is going to have to settle for two relics at the end of all this. Uh, or I will he? I that. What? Will he? What? Oh, <laughs> yoink. <laughs> that cancel. I, I was like, why Why is he cancel? What's happening here? Yeah, it looks like he will get it in the end, though. Although Wolves uh, will continue to attack, he won't die to it this time. I think you can't pick up the relic if you're being attacked or something like that. I'm not sure if that's a bug or a feature, but the Wolf was actually attacking that prelate. And I think if you are trying to pick it up, the moment the wolf bites you, it might not be possible. This being said, as you said, there is going to be three relics in here. Part of the reason why Kaz was so successful doing this is because he went for a couple of uh, relics over here. He still has two, and he actually is free, and he has lost one. So he went all the way up to four prelates. He really committed to grabbing all those relics out there. And it looks like Beastie is in the danger of losing that prelate to the wolves. Knight comes in to yeah, save the holy man. The whole time. Just three wolves chasing this poor old man across the map. <laughs> yeah, he does get it in the end. So he'll bank two. It is unfortunate to be behind like this. It means that Beastie really has to find a way to kind of try and aggress. I don't think you can just sit back and cruise to Imperial. Because you're going to be behind. At every stage, you're going to be behind. Maybe BC has like a wider perspective on this and like, oh, well, I mean, he's going to beat me in Imperial, but I won't be that far behind and my position on the map is better because I'm the central player. But I, I don't know if you necessarily want to just sit back entirely. Maybe look for some way to be aggressive. Maybe with boom ships in the situation. I, I think like demos could maybe get you back in this game. If you can stunt the food economy of Kazza at all, then it makes it very hard for him to play the game. You can see that Kazza has shown his intent. He walls the crossing and he doesn't want to come out and play anymore. He's like, I'll be back out to play when I'm a big boy in Imperial. And that's going to take a matter of seconds here as he's already ready and the palace of swabi is being built absolutely perfect timings and i love that he's using those extra pellets to secure the sacred sites like as i said he doesn't really have any other use to those pellets his entire eco is boosted by the Aachen chapel so might as well move out secure the sacred sites even if you end up losing those scholars out there sacred sites will be neutralized but as you said there is already imperial age coming out for kasva and beast is nowhere close and while Beastie's turn to add knights over here, Kazva will have the economy to just start pumping out those uh, Imperial Age elite knights. And as you said, demolition ships could be an option. Carracks could be a very nice option as well. The cannon ships should be able to control choke points as well very effectively. Might even be able to reach that Regnitz Cathedral from the shoreline, honestly. Possibly. I, th I feel like Karras is kind of wonky to play with, right? I feel like Bombards is just too lethal of a, of a threat. Like, you know your opponent's eventually going to get there, but it could be we see that. I think the bigger concern here is because Beastie did build that many knights, he made his intent very clear. If you actually look in Kazva's base, there is not a single military building anywhere. I mean, in a way, Palace of Swabi is a military building because I feel like you can get enough villages out quick enough. You can just arm the peasantry at this stage of the game. Um, not a popular strategy, but honestly, they're so expendable. Who cares? But now that you're going to see that fix, right? Right away in the back, just dropping the quadruple racks. This was all enabled the fact he didn't even dip his toe in the military side of things. When we look in BC's base, look what he had at the back. Trip stables. So BC, like, he'll try to cruise up and float himself into Imperial Age, but he's not just stopping unit production. He understands that the only way he can really win this now is he has to be in position to take a formidable fight with superior numbers at the start of his own Imperial Age. That is the point at which you can trip Kazra up, but it is a very, very thin path to walk. It is very thin indeed, especially with Kazra now having the Palace of Schwabia, meaning that Every second that Beastie is not in Imperial, Kazva is increasing that eco lead. Now, that's a scary force of knights over here, and mobility advantage would be on the side of Beastie, should he get in. But as you see, 
There are two prelates behind to heal up the villagers that are being attacked by the knights, and the villagers just keep repairing the walls. As you said, at this point, the villagers become throwaway units with the pass of Shrabi operating. And Imperial Age yes. is on already. Oh, sorry. And of course, the veteran uh, spearmen are coming in. Did, did they really look scary when you just have this many villagers? They just really <laughs> don't, right? This looks so stupidly trivial. It's just so silly. I mean, like, even without the prelates, it's, it's almost like, it's, I don't know if you know Warhammer, it's like they're just the commissars standing there with a gun to the, the head of the, the peasants, reminding them that they're expendable. Like, repair faster, you peons. Like, yes, my lord. <laughs> work, work. Like, you just don't have any choice here. You just keep bodying more villagers because they only cost 12 food each and you're wasting so much time of beasties and all the while that rax infrastructure continues to inflate and all the tech upgrades are being rushed fast and it's all in on the spears because you've shown your hand so river chainmail is going to be coming out the tech up to get them into the veteran stats on the spin is going to be there as well and i wouldn't be surprised if we see one or two blacksmiths yeah first one will be already being dropped to the back to prep himself fully to be as bulky as possible these spearmen the knights will break Blowing in, and this is hold. going to make things a little concerning here for Kazva. But as you said, the spearmen are coming out, so the question is how much damage Beastie can cause with these, because he's definitely going to have a window, but he needs two damage here. Otherwise, the Palace of Schwabia will be able to compensate for those losses really fast. Well, Spearman try and chase him about really what he needs to get his hands on. I think the most vital thing, and yeah, he's researching it. He knows Kazva is going straight for the marching drills. If he gets marching drills, when you get in charging range of these knights, you almost gap close. It's ridiculous with the spears. So looking to just get close him, push him towards the back of the base, pin him in where he cannot escape. And then once they die, yeah. remember how pricey these units are for Beastie. Like you have to times this by 11. It's 240 per unit. That's an insane investment. And it's to a lose, trap. Even the stage of HRE. It's a trap. Like, the knights have it no means top. of escaping here. It looks like they will actually sandwich themselves in between the house and the wood line, but really, Kazva had the window to just trap all those knights over there. Uh, more knights are coming in from the left side, and Kazva might not be able to stop the bleeding because Beastie's up oh to God. Imperial. Yeah, and they're elite knights now. Now they're problematic. I think he had an opportunity to block them in, just use the villagers to keep them stuck on the spot for the spears, but now you're in trouble. He's just rushing through. And you're going to take a heavy hit. And remember, the, yes, you have the Palace of Swabia, but Beastie is now up there as well. So he's actually going to increase his eco at the blinding speed. In fact, Beastie already five, made that six villages ahead of that of Kazva. And all of a sudden, this game starts to take a turn for the worse because Beastie knows what's happening. He spots the back of the base. He sees the only thing that Kazva can make is infantry. And it means that he can just keep dancing circles around him the entire time. This is part of the reason why I was a little scared for those barracks for Kazva because lack of mobility is haunting him so much. He's actually pulling up a Karak up the river. Behind this one, Beastie has the Sacred Sites as well. So the Sacred Site countdown is going on starting at like 1530. So Kazva is forced to make a move very soon here. And as you said, now that Imperial Age is in for Beastie, he has Elite Knights. He's going to have the Pass of Shrabia working as well. And suddenly, Beastie's taking over on the Villager Department. Yeah, and these knights are going to be formidable. Like, you're talking about an open battlefield. You've invested all into infantry. It means you're slow static. It means that Beastie can still be flexible. And my biggest concern is when you have this defensible location, you have to move out to the central island. What well, if your opponent just wraps the west with these very fast knights? That's a possibility that you have to be scared of. Kazva really needs to wall up this west side to prevent this ever happening again. It shouldn't have happened in the first place. His village account should have been good enough to keep that palisade up, even against that many knights. And because he failed to do so, all of a sudden, Beastie is given a golden route back into this game, and it could get scary very fast. Scary for who? That's the question, though, because Beastie currently sits at 8 military, out of which I don't see a single archer. Okay, now he's getting some men at arms going. Or maybe even Lansknechte. This is the rare situation where Lansknechte would work so well against all those spears. For a moment, it looked scary because Kazva is coming in with 50 army, and he's gonna have his window to potentially try to burn down even the Ragnitz Cathedral. I guess the best thing he could potentially do is actually target those houses near that uh, depleted mine because that could slow down his opponent's transition to heavy infantry. Once the men at arms or the Lansknechte hit the field, I don't see uh. Kazva being able to stop that, but he's gonna have a window to burn down the cathedral. Yeah, that's the big deal. And this is where this formation for BC is risky. The moment you give ground, like having your Renitz computer at the front of your base and your Raxes at the back, this feels backwards. This feels like it should be the other way around. This is going to hurt so much. 600 gold per minute all of a sudden sunk out of your eco and relics just sitting on the ground. The Siege Workshop as well, that's another 300 wood that's going to be burnt in the blink of an eye. And this is all due to just uh, zerging Vet Spearmen. That's literally all it is coming out from Kazva right now. This is before we even see siege weapons arrive. You can talk about the character, but that really made no difference to what's happening now. And they're just going to continue to body in. 
There's a few mana arms out, but you don't care because his spearmen move so fast and they have decent damage. They can chase down your villagers. Textiles will alleviate some of the pain for Beastie, but no denying the fact that he is miles behind all of a sudden because he allows that cathedral to go down at the front of his base. Indeed, as long as that cathedral is dead, that's a massive advantage here for Kazva. He's also going to do quite a lot of damage to the villager department, not as impactful as the cathedral itself. And now he's going to have to address the problem of the mana terms, but... This gives him a window to neutralize at least one of the sacred sites. In fact, he is likely to neutralize both. And he actually managed to do quite a lot of damage to Beast's eco here, especially in terms of idle time. He had to idle all those farmers, ton of villagers garrisoned in the TCs, and you still haven't uh, secured that Ragnit's Cathedral as now Kazva is bringing in his own men at arms. Yeah, and you can see, you see, just look at the income per minute. Like, it's just insane the advantage Kazva all of a sudden has. And these repairs coming out from the villages are so slow. And with those mana arms there now, 15 damage per strike. Textiles makes it a little bit harder to get through you. But you cannot repair the cathedral quick enough. And this is the problem. And they'll have to garrison. More mana arms coming in. And they move so fast. We saw the power of the spears running through your economy at 1.72 movement speed. These mana arms are just as lethal. But luckily, BC is starting to get the Maganels out. And this could save him. It could be a saving grace, but he needs to be quick. Langstead moving in. The cleave damage is going to come out. The village is being butchered. <laughs> Gone oh in the blink God. of an eye. This is the power of HRE, baby. Just get that cleave, that wide swing with the sword. And in the blink of an eye, half your village account just disappears. And those villagers are starting to get more and more impactful because the farming eco is gonna increase in importance as that Karak is sailing upriver and Beastie's food eco is going to collapse under the pressure from that Karak. He's going to have to work with the farming eco exclusively. Oh. He's able to secure the Regnitz Cathedral once again, but I feel like Kazva's giving him such a huge window to work with and suddenly a game where Kazva seemed to be on the back foot is now even at best for Beastie. And we're starting to see the power of the Central Island. Look what BC done again. He wrapped two knights around the side. He was flanking, he was poking, prodding at the, these, these villages. He's doing the same with a group of man at arms, but it's double the distance to cover, really, when you think about it. Luckily, in this kind of mirror positioning, like compared to most maps, it's a little bit more even. But there's no denying that Kazva can reach your base quicker. And because of where you situated your cathedral, he's reaching the more important detail. He will finally repair this cathedral, but just think of the damage done, the minutes lost of gathering passive gold into the eco of BC, and how now. How much does that cripple him? That's the question you have to ask. And this is going to cripple him more. Kazva, game one, very questionable keep. But game two, this is the type of definitive keep. But BC looking to counter out with his own. Yeah, that is just such a good keep over there for Kazva. There is the Lansnick there moving in. And I don't think that Beast has got the villagers to uh -oh. build this one. Just a few villagers building it. And all of them will be slain by the Lansnick. And I feel like if this keep goes up for Kazva, the one for Beast, he won't. No, it, there's no way you get it up now. The Maganels need to move across to deal with that more than the Langstech. The Langstech could have been dealt with by the Man at Arms, which is now happening. But the fact that so many villagers get away with what is clearly a crime in the base of Beastie. That's the problem here. This keep is worthless even if it goes up. The Bombard is at least here. That can help for the moment. But with 32 villagers in position. How the hell do you siege this quick enough? Well, the answer might be Maganels, but it means Kazva, he can actually sidestep this. And between the volleys from the Maganels, he can back off, dodge the damage, and then come back and repair every time. Looks like he's giving up on this one, especially as he's depleting his wood stores. But still, he is going to secure that position, and that's also going to give him a chance to secure the sacred site in the middle. Further increasing oh, his gold this. income, but the men at arms are breaking in on the left side. What happened over there? Is there an overchop? Yeah, oh, no. yep, it's another chop. He never realized it. Because the wall was still burst on the south side, he thought that was how BC got him previously. That wasn't the case. It's that tiny sneak from the snake, and all of a sudden, Kazva, the limiting resource for him right now is wood. This is the thing he cannot afford to have being butchered. And because there's so many pings in the west, in the base of BC, he doesn't know that this is happening right now. And so many dead villages in the blink of the eye, all of a sudden, BC with the eco lead once again. That was at least like 30, 40 villagers slain, and you just got no tools to stop this right now. It's only villagers. Your farming eco is under pressure as well. Coverings being added by Kazva against the siege on the right side, though. I feel like Kazva is still in a better position once he stopped this bleeding, but he needs to stop this one because it is getting more and more infuriating at this point. And this is costly. These Maganels have no defense for them. The Knights could easily just burn them down, but it looks like the Knights are just going to ride off because BC has better ideas. Look what he spotted in the center. He knows that there's gold being mined here, and you could butcher in mass again with just five knights, which is why Kazva peels them off quickly. And he's going to try to rush a keep, but how many poor innocent German civilians have to die for another castle to be built? 
Hopefully not too much because you got the man at arms and the Lansknecht there over there. So ultimately it's just a couple of losses out there for Kazva. But what's more important is that this forced Kazva to pull the man at arms from the battlefield. And that is going to yep. result in the loss of not only the key, but also two very expensive Culverins. Um, no and cannon emplacement. The, the, the Culverins cost more than the keeps. That's the crazy yep. detail, right? When you break that down in your mind as a resource allocation, that is nuts to think about. That it's, you just sacrificed over 3,000 resources, right? Or about 3,000 resources. Yeah, I, it's, it's I, I don't know, man. This game was clearly in Kaz's hand, but Beastie has worked some sleight of hand magic, and all of a sudden he's going to sneak in again with more knights in the Kaz's eco lines. Oh, please have mercy on the villagers. Oh boy, it's just the overchops that are just depleting Kazva's eco. And you are starting to see that there is a toll taken on his eco with this. Because now you're seeing an increased army for Beastie. Beastie's at a 200 population, versus his opponent isn't. Uh, and once again, uh, the men uh, at arms just sandwich their way through these little choke points. Such a frustration <laughs> yeah. for Kazva. <laughs> My favorite part is just the instant wall after was like, whoopsie, uh, sorry, we seem to have an architectural flaw in our design plan here. Kazva failing to actually stop them. That's going to be 15 man arms running to your uh, economy. He will counter it as his army is in position this time, but you know what the bigger problem this is? It means your army isn't in the central anymore. It's not in the central island. It's not pressuring your opponent's base. BC is getting a lot of breathing room, and look what he's doing with that breathing room. Look at the size of his military force now. The Bombard's coming out, the Mangonels, the Culverins. He's got a nice composition to back up this frontline of Man at Arms, and this game all of a sudden is getting very scary for Kazva, and he's walling himself in entirely. He's just ignoring the problem. It doesn't exist. He's going to actually cover his crossing with stone walls here, and look to probably back off a lot of these villages from the central island entirely. And he had to pull the Karak up the north as well, so there is absolutely no control for him on the river. If he had two or three demolition ships here, he would just wipe out that entire army, but he's got none. And up north, you're also seeing a forward being established by Beastie, ready to potentially dock the river and just try to pump out some demolition ships to prevent Kazwa's forces from crossing. Mm -hmm. This could get very oppressive very fast. Uh, I mean, it kind of already feels that way. With only Maganels really to defend yourself as well. Not mention the Bombards can counter out the Carrot. The Carrot kind of loses its relevance at this stage, I feel like. And with this many man at arms, this keep is going to be gone. With the siege weapons as well, there's no easy way to move out and defend it. And if you do, you might just lose your main army and as a result lose the game. So Kazva likely to just forfeit this over. But if he forfeits that, that, he's moving out. The, uh, this could be dangerous. He's got I a cover in. Arms. <laughs> what? Well, Beastie's kind of gone suicidal with his lads here. Really wanting to kill off a few villages, but he's going to turn it into a win as he moves across to the Maganels now. Trying to burst through them. We'll only get one, but that does mean he has a slight artillery lead, at least for the moment, until Kazva sneaks in and gets rid of Beastie's military army on the back foot as the artilleries are flying behind the stone walls, but not before they lose two of them. I think that was a Bombard and a Maganel, right? So actually, um, trade it. Yep. It goes the way of Kazva. Yep. That was actually a good fight for Kazva out there. Kazva also has a Culverin, so he can snap those siege weapons right now. But now he has bumped into a stone wall. There is a forward position here for Beastie, and he's chopping oh, wood no. up north. Beastie's struggling yeah. to access wood. Well, all, well, I'll tell you what, Beastie's not struggling to access. Villagers, he's in again with the Man of Arms. Because he delayed them, he pulled them back. They went raiding again and once again delayed Kazva's gathering. He cannot afford to have gaps in his eco for the wood. You can see the numbers right now. In fact, both of them, that's what they struggle on. You mentioned Beastie, but Kazva is in just a delicate of a situation. This wood line is going to be depleted soon. And there's not much safe wood left around here at all. Not at all. He's going to have to venture all the way to the far left over here. Luckily, it's Stonewall now. He's going to bump into Stone Wars from Beastie. And we're sort of getting into a stalemate because it looks like both players just fortify themselves with Stone Wars and neither of them is able to break the defense of the other. Yeah, it looks like Beastie got a little bit more leverage up to the west, right? He's secured the sacred site there. He's got some resources back here he can tap into. And it means there's going to be this vital wood line they're going to be fighting over if this game goes long term in the west that both of them have kind of walled around. So we'll see if that comes back into play as the game goes on. I doubt it, mainly just because all prioritizations on this central island. As we see Kazza pushing forward to get rid of this keep that had been planted by Beastie. And Beastie has been grabbing straggler trees where he can here. But he won't be able to for much longer as the keep is definitely going to fall. I say that, oh my god! Fight. That's a terrible fight. I mean, the Lansknecht are super fragile, and the boiling oil is going to burn them down so easily, and the Culverins are terrible against buildings. He needs at least one cannon to fight. That was an absolutely horrendous decision to go wow. for that. Yeah, I was surprised he dove in with the, the, the infantry. I thought he was going to wrap around on the side, but essentially just decides he wants to get a nice little facial treatment of boiling oil. Not the smartest way to go. 
And all of a sudden, Beastie sees the opportunity. He moves in. Maganel shots coming out. Needs to back up quickly. Being chased away by the man at arms. Although Kazva takes a big hit to his military count, he's still ahead of Beastie on that count. However, Beastie does have more man at arms coming in soon. He could prep himself. Really needs a few more Maganels to play with in these areas. Because so far, really, combat is just coming down to that. It's man at arms versus man at arms en masse. So if you have three or four of these Maganels, all of a sudden that army disappears in the blink of an eye. When was the last time you saw a Siege Tower? Because if you go all the <laughs> way to the left side, you're going to see one. Kazma is getting a Siege Tower going on the left side. Oh my god. I mean, the question is whether it's going to be that valuable because there's a keep here already and it has hot boiling oil in it for you boys. So we'll find out the man arms are happy to actually run past it in this situation. But uh, it's looking like it's drunk driving for the moment. I will say that much. Man arms are going to move across to count this out. But just as you think maybe siege towers are good, you remember how long they take to build. And if you want to use them correctly, maybe don't build them in the vision of your opponent. <laughs> we'll see what Kazva can do with this, though. He's going to try to run past the keep. A few mana arms will make their way into the eco lines. The question is, what can you do when you've got this many MAAs chasing you at all times? Absolutely nothing. You built a siege tower to die like this. I value the effort, I really do, but it was probably the least effective thing I've seen for a long time. It would have been more resource effective to just make a bombard and knock that castle down in the middle. Something that he was yeah. dearly missing, and he actually threw away a lot of Lundsnecht out there. And if you look at the resource banks, Beastie's banking up a ton of resources. This is something we haven't talked about yet. Beastie has a massive boom. In fact, I would borderline sit over boom. 140 villagers plus the Ragnitz Cathedral. I get the feel that that's quite a lot of eco as compared to Kazva, who is, I think, having a slightly better balance, just adding more army and less villagers. But this also allows Beastie to bank up a ton of resources and play for long game. Yeah, I think for BC, like, he's leveraging the fact that stone walls are in place, so he doesn't need a big army because there's nowhere that Kazza's running clearly. He's just counter-sieging him and buying time. But you can see that Kazza's just cheesing him out a little bit here as he continues the stone wall. And BC is starting to get a little bit of a footing in the south. He could try to wrap deeper with this bombard, try to snipe out the keep in the north, maybe wrap into the base slowly but surely. And I think that is his intent. He switches across to the west wall, understanding that going for the central island is exactly what Kazza wants. It's where he's playing, but it's where Kazza is also pushing as he moves in from the main army, looking to get rid of this stone wall. Maganel the Lundsnecks are so fragile Ooh. out there. Those Mangonels are just wiping them out so easily. And on the left side, Beastie is going to smash through those walls, something that Kazva isn't noticing because Kazva has to babysit his army here. He can't take his eyes away from this army. The moment he does that, he's going to get those units wiped out by the Mangonels. Yep, and these Mangonels, if they roll a little bit too fast for, they might just get sniped out instantly by the culverins. And this really is going to come down to who's got Mangonels. And only one side has culverins, so... I don't know, I'm not really a better man, but if I was to bet on who'd take this fight if it went underway right now, it'd actually give it a beastie, despite the fact that he's out Zerg, just because of the power of Maganels. Meanwhile, the power of Man at Arms compels you as BC is riding in for another raid on the poor red HRE. And that is going to force a garrison. That is going to force you to respond as well. There's so many Man at Arms here. I don't think you can just trust the defenses to deal with them on their own. Yep, a couple of Lundsnake that will be mixed in. They don't perform particularly well against the Man at Arms, though, so you probably just want to meet this one with your own Man at Arms. Kaz was making more and more of those light units out there, but they're just so fragile, as in the middle, the villagers will actually knock down one bombard that blasted through the walls, and it looks like knights are reappearing on the battlefield for Beastie, so he wants to renew those uh, high mobility efforts to try and get yeah. some more raids going. That's a little bit more difficult to catch with infantry. Well, because he's been given access. He's just noticed this. Look what he runs into. He's like, wait, you didn't even wall this? You built military buildings here? This is a mess, Kazva. Where's your organization? Where's your natural defenses? Let me show you why you need them. As he runs deeper into the farmlands of the HRE, Kazva might be in a little bit of trouble because that is going to be followed up by those knights very quickly. And it means that you might find your economy grinding to a halt. And once again, someone to highlight again is the fact that BC has huge amounts of surplus. Look how much wood he has. He can actually weather the storm. If Kazva gets stunted here, he's going to deplete all his resources in the blink of an eye. And that is a little bit worrying if you're a Kazza fan. Absolutely. Like, as long as Beast is able to hold with this uh, low amounts of army, or relatively low amounts of army oh. compared to Kazva, it's perfect. Because well, he, he just banks he, up resources, and he will have a buffer to work with. He just baited and switched him again. Look at the Central Island. Beast, he went in. He's like, oh, good. You've given up on this then. Takes out the keep. He's going to be able to burn down the fourth base. And now Kazva has to make a very awkward choice. Do I defend my villages? Do I defend my expansion? And he's going to be torn back and forth. And that is the weakness of this static army. As it looks like he's going to make the decision to hard commit to defend the central island. But will he be able to punish is the question. Villages are nearby. Beastie could easily rebuild the walls here. 
but for the moment, he's going to let it be. Man at Arms going to ride out. Maganels could turn around for some shots right now as Kazva is engaged. In fact, Kazva is baiting himself in a little bit too deep here. Shots out onto Langsdek. Langsdek continue to pursue through for the moment. Villagers will be able to repair onto the siege weapons. And as they reach the safety of the keep, we feel like Kazva can't really stick on this siege line for much longer. Not at all. There's a transport ship coming out here for Kazva, though. He's trying to break this stalemate as much as possible. And if you look at the army numbers, that's still better for Kazva. And one thing that Beast doesn't really have anymore is gold miners. He depleted all the gold available to him, whereas Kazva still has 2,000, actually 3,000 in the middle gold mine, and multiple gold deposits on his side. So Kazva controlling the middle for a long time allowed him to prioritize those gold mines and just leave his own for a later time. But Beastie, ready to push the middle uh. over there. Yeah, this is scary, actually. That's a lot of bombards that have been massed. All of a sudden, Kazva can be outclassed if he's not careful. He really has to out-micro these fights. But if he gets caught in a cluster, this could backfire quickly. Kazva winning the initial fight with the Lang's deck, but the Maganels are about to arrive. Shots are going to come out on the wrong target, though, and the bombards are rolling too deep. And I think he might lose them. They're a little bit too far out this time. Kazva is going to chase in. Maganel is going to be burnt up in the blink of an eye, and they are going to stick to these bombards like glue because it's worthwhile as a trade. Needs to be careful with Langsnet coming on the side. And now the backstab! This could clean him up. Kazva might get one or two bombards, but the sneaking of a few Langsnet, the cleave damage out from BC will annihilate the vanguard of Kazva. Yeah, Kazva was just a little too greedy trying to take down those bombards. He knows that he needs that castle up over there. He forgot about his Karakat. He's got multiple transports now. Three transports overall. So he really wants to break this stalemate, but there's just so many things happening at the same time that he can't really focus on those. Spearman being mixed in here, interesting choice for Beastie. <laughs> I guess it's a wrong hotkey. I, I think it's just vision. <laughs> They're just cannon fodder vision, maybe. <laughs> it kind of feels like it, right? The bombards just need to see what they want to strike, and they are striking hard. Everything is dying. Look how desperate Kazra is. He's built trebuchets. Oh my goodness, this... Despite the gold lead you were talking about, Kazva is starting to feel the pressure and Beastie pushing out just enough troops to get his, keep his opponent rather at bay and ensure that his artillery army over time is escalating ahead of Kazva's. And that really is starting to make the difference here in an Imperial on Imperial matchup. It is. However, Beastie is running dangerously low on gold. He still has that 600 gold per minute income. But now he can't really afford a lunch neck, those are just way too gold heavy for him. Whereas for Kazva, he's starting to bank up a ton of gold here. And soon Beast is gonna have to find alternative sources of gold, because I don't think that he can sustain this. And there's the lunch neck trade coming in here, with an attempt to just run the blockade to the transports, I guess. Two transports will get past the keep here. But, I mean, the Bombard's already set up on the shoreline, and we're seeing archers yeah. being added. Archers oh. are being added here as... Wait a minute! The University of Kazva is being burned down by two men at arms oh, at the back of his base. Bombard! Bombard! Can he get it? It gets oh, it! No, nope. the lags to get out! They're in! Panic sets in. BC needs to react to that. That was so close to completely failing. Kazva will be able to draw some attention. But as you mentioned, yeah, the archery range is coming out. It's because he has huge surpluses of food and wood. And if you look at the trading that bc has been doing, it's not worth it to trade for gold anymore. He's depleted. It's 48 gold for 100 wood. You don't want that trade when wood is such a finite resource at this stage of the game. Instead, he wants to min max. And in fairness, when you see your opponent is mainly pushing out Langsnek, these archers will be quite effective. The focus of the battle will soon shift away from the middle towards the left side because, as you said, wood soon will become a luxury commodity. So suddenly you will have to prioritize the left side where the leftover wood is because the middle island is almost depleted. It's just barren of resources. You get a couple of trees over here and, of course, you got the neutral market, but that's all. Kazvo also never secured a sacred site in the middle, which could have been a very nice extra source of gold. Uh, neither did Beast do that on the far left, so... Some opportunities missed on both sides, as Kazva is back to 200 population, Beastie as well. But now, Beastie is uh, back on track with the gold department, and just get the feel that his priorities, being on the left side, is actually going to be better and better. In fact, he's about to chop through on the left side, so he would have a window to chop through and then just hit Kazva's mm -hmm. lumberjacks. I just give a big shout out to Jack and Jill from the Beastie Army, uh, the two man at arms that were sitting in the back of the base. Yep. They went up a hill to fetch a pellet of war, instead burnt down a university. Yep. They sat there that long, Kazva just ignored it the entire time. And the reason he Ooh. ignores it is because his economy is like shifting hard away. Like you said, those wood lines become very valuable, the gold lines, like half his eco isn't even in his base anymore. It's almost just a secondary factor. And as we know, the past of Swap is so easy to replace. I think Kazva is hard past the point where he cares if you attack his villages. It's just a big shrug and a sigh. And Beast is adding trade. 
it's not going to have Finally. an immediate effect, but it's in the long run, that's the way to go. Um, he probably doesn't need a ton of traders, like talk about, let's say, 10, uh, 15, 20 at maximum, but it is I an infinite source more. of uh, gold, and that's it. Yeah, I think he wants more. He's got free marketplace. Like, I think he's going to escalate this quite big, probably delete like a giant chunk of his, his worker force and just rely on that, because in fairness, like Kazva hasn't shown any attempts to push around here. Barely defend himself, in fact. Like, he never tried to rebuild that initial wall that got breached. He built one further back. He's essentially just surrendering this area. Kazra is just trying to be a giant onion as he builds layers upon layers. But Beastie at this rate is going to turn into Hammer's going to smash him. Just by the fact that in the coming 5-10 minutes, his gold influx is going to be vastly ahead of that of Kazra's. And Kazra's already been failing to make good trades on the artillery front. Like, this might be an opportunity for that to change, though. I think this is the first time I've been impressed by Kazra's artillery formation in several minutes. He has five bombards and four culverins. This could be good. One thing that could also have been good for Kazva is using those Karax. He still has the river under his control, but he never really leveraged that. He could have gotten a Karak out to start knocking down that keep on the shoreline. Instead, he's charging him with the Manatars, bringing the Bombards as well, but he needs to be careful. He can't just run into the range of that castle and get killed by the boiling oil. Mm -hmm. And he has to be worried about what's coming. BC's trying to shift his, his army across now, right? He's got a, a better composition. He's got Bombard's Culverins and the Maganels. Bombard's starting to work their way through this keep. You can see the move out by the Man at Arms. You're going to have to buffer this to defend against it. Archer's coming out as well. Not necessarily great against the Man at Arms. And in fairness, there's no longer Lang's next. So the Archers don't really have their value anymore. Keep is going to fall that belong to Beastie. Beastie's still running on huge surpluses of food and wood, but no way to spend it right now. And that market is now exposed, so... Luckily for Beast, he only has a couple of traders bound to this one because if he had the most of his eco in the traders already, that would be an absolute disaster. And as I said, those archers are completely irrelevant right now. They're getting absolutely slaughtered by the bombards, the man at arms over here. This is a massive win here for Kazva. Beast is losing a tremendous amount of units Although, in just a matter of seconds. The Maganels have arrived. Speaking of losing a lot of units oh in boy. seconds, this is where it turns around. The rocks are flying. And Kazva, he didn't see it because they're hiding in the stone wall gate. Oh my god, and he warned himself in! <laughs> I don't think this was intended. I think Kazva forgot some. That's one of those moments where like, you, you kind of go to the shopping mall, you feel good, you come home, you're like, I think I forgot something. Oh my god, I left my kid in the car! <laughs> and that keep is just getting rebuilt this second that Beastie is able to secure that position, but this is, I think, what Kazva was waiting for. Because now you pulled all those slow-moving artillery units from Beastie to the left side and suddenly Kazva is amplifying the pressure over here on the right side with eight bombards and it is just two keeps keeping him away from the Raglitz Cathedral and potentially all the other key landmarks. But it's Langsneck, that's the problem. Look at the damage straight away. Like, this is not your forward army. My concern is he needs more man arms here. He kind of had the wrong idea. Maybe the Langsneck on the other side could clean up, but instead they get cleaned up so easily. Because they are not frontlining units. He's barely got any MAAs here. The Bombards will get through the keeps, but it should allow time for Beastie to respond. The problem is that Beastie is only being reactionary. He needs to be proactive. This is not the guy who kept sieging through and running knights into his opponent's eco lines anymore. This is a man running circles around himself. And at this point, if you start taking on the Dragnet's Cathedral, it's just going to be massive because keep in mind, that you need to spend wood to repair this, and wood becomes a luxury commodity soon. Beast has got a ton of that banked up, but you can't afford to repair buildings endlessly at this point. Oh, here we go. Fire arrows coming out. Not exactly very effective, as we're seeing. It takes what feels like a million years to burst through even a culverin. Bombards are arriving. Culverin's trying to counter out the attacks coming out from Kazza's troops. Maganel's going to back up as BC understands they're not needed right now. And it looks like Kazva, without a front line, will be forced to retreat. The question is, what will he lose on the outro? Probably a few of these bombards. One of them seems to be dancing in with the enemy forces, trying to pretend it's blue. But he's <laughs> going to go for the longer off targets. Understands that Kazo doesn't want to turn around. Remember, the turn rate of these units can be quite slow. So if he ever chooses to return fire, he's going to have to go stationary and then spend like half a second plus just turning the cannon around. Still a tremendous amount of archers here for Beastie, but now that the men at arms appear in numbers, it suddenly becomes a way better fight for Kazva. He kind of needs to give up on the Lunsnack there for the time being, although... Now that those archers are clustered up, they're actually doing a pretty decent job dealing with these archers. It's not just that, actually. If you if you drag across, what you'll occasionally notice is a small quantity of hand cannon is. Yep. Because there aren't many man at arms in these formations anymore. Kazza keeps like switching back and forth between hard MAA and hard Langsnack. And of course, 
Pan Cannoneers can tick both those boxes pretty easily. And because you're not building them en masse and they're weirdly snuck in amongst all these golden hats, it's very hard for Kazva to understand what is shooting him for maximum value and snipe it out easily. Beastie is going to have a good trade set up now. And suddenly, I feel like Kazva is going to be on the timer. Kazva's gold income is still better than Beastie's one, though. But everything else is just in the favor of uh, Kazva. Oh my God. Was that a keep or a wall? It looked like a wall with that many bombards shooting it. Uh, no, but that, that was a keep. That was uh, a keep out there that was just absolutely molten by no less than eight bombards. And the same keep is going to be taken down as well. Just a little bit to the south. And as you said, the problem here for Beastie is that he's just the reactor. He's always just the one reacting to what Kazva is doing. And Kazva still has free relics in Ragnar's Cathedral. And Kazva's got the middle island to trade the, with the trade post with. So... Kazva can do the exact same things as Beastie, but he still will have that extra relic over his opponent. Yeah, you've always got to ask that question in the game. Am I playing to win or playing to survive? And really, although Kazva maybe is not playing optimally, he's playing to, to win. It feels like Beastie in a lot of ways in the last several minutes has been forced to play to survive. But now moving out with the archers, maybe you can try to skirmish and be more aggressive. My only concern is like these archers have walls to get through. You're always limited by your siege army. And your siege army right now has been kind of scratched and clawed to pieces by the power spike of Kazva's cannons. Kazva's cannons, which you can say 10 times, another one of those nice little tongue twisters that are moving in now on the west side on their own because Beastie isn't reacting here anymore. And this is very greedy, very risky, but Kazmo is going to get a lot of value for it and not really be punished. And the thing is that he's using that as a window to push the right side as well. Look at the men-at-arms marching in from the right as well. He's realizing that with the keeps oh gone, God. the men-at-arms can just rush in. I actually wonder if that's just bad pathfinding or what, because they're heading straight to the left side. Uh, I think he's just trying to get formation because he understands that BC isn't here to defend. Like, you saw him take an attack in a uh, fight in the central island here, and oh my God, the Maganels arrive! <laughs> and that's the archer army gone. Beastie, this is problematic. He's still got plenty of military for the moment, but it doesn't really feel like they're present and able anymore. The artillery army back in his base. He's going to try and hold off the man arms at the moment. The main cluster is finally going to arrive, and he has started to switch into those premium units more heavily with the hand cannoneers. This could be a difference maker, but my concern is he now has to address the amount of Maganels that Kazwa is pushing to the front. It feels like he's been waiting all game for the right moment, and all of a sudden, Kazwa actually has that swing in these clustered fights because he's bringing four Maganels to the engagements. And behind this one, Kazva is knocking down buildings on the left side as well, trying to establish a forward position. I think this keep isn't going up, but ultimately, Kazva is slowly grinding down his opponent over here, just marching forward inch by inch. Yeah, because the cool thing that Kazva done continuously through this game is maintain control on the central island. So he can flex you on the west. Beastie has this really tough choice. He's got his eco on the west, but he needs to push through the north. And being pushed through the north right now by Kazva is he's found the wood lines. That's going to deny him. It won't hurt Beastie right now, but it's just territorial control being denied. And remember, this is where his trade route has been established. So that could actually hurt him in the coming minutes. In the meantime, he's going to take a fight in the west, though. And it's going to be a switch into horsemen. Beastie's getting a little bit desperate here, but he needs anything and everything he can get. These horsemen, however, will not fare well against Mana Arms and Lang's Neck. And Beastie's got a tremendous amount of food and food in the bank, but currently the most valuable resource that he has is just population. Oh, my God. He, yeah, but Be Beastie broke through. He finally broke through the wood wall. Uh, the wooden line, rather. And, and Kazva hasn't rebuilt here yet. So this is going to be an opening. Look how many horsemen are about to ride oh through to Kazva's side of the map. I didn't even see that many horsemen being on the field. And this could be a game winner. This could be a game winner because everything that Kazva has is wide open here. He's riding in. And there's a lot of spread here. Like the military district alone, you could snipe out a lot of this. Remember, horsemen at this stage raise buildings pretty fast, especially in this quantity. They'll turn to deal with the Bombards. Nice cost-effective trade in the blink of an eye. It's just going to be gone. Moves in onto the village line. Starts to butcher them as well. Kazva has a decent surplus of reserve wood, but that will dry up quickly when you're replacing these artillery units. And Beastie can do the same for much longer. That's the difference maker here. Kazva really needs to stab in and find a victorious moment in the coming minutes as he pushes in his base. Otherwise, this is going to backfire quickly because he's going to be forced of that vital ingredient. The wood is being depleted quickly on his side as well. And Beastie has at least saved enough to make his way through the winter. Something we cannot say of Kazva as well. Kazva is starting to get desperate over here trying to take down the trade. But at this point, as you said, it's going to come down to whether Kazva can finish this game before he's depleted of his resources. Both players still have 200 population though. And there is always one thing to consider. Every villager that Kazva loses right now will be replaced with a military unit as he's adding some spears. 
And as he's replacing his villagers with military units, he's gonna have a big momentum coming in on the left side, marching up with the Bombards and the Mangonels. And he's getting well, close to the landmarks. Pass of Shrabia within is. range. But look what BC done. He dropped a keep near the Ford military district. He's denying the reinforcements via this placement. It's going to slow down the trickle of reinforcements in Kazva. And you can see he's prepping the horsemen for a defense right now. So he will react to this. And then Kazva might be in trouble. His food has been depleted. His wood is draining quickly. And this army could be expended in the blink of an eye because these horsemen will zerg right over on top of the Maganels so swiftly. Movement in. Sticking on top of him, ignoring the melee units. He doesn't care. It's just about getting rid of the Maganels, the Bombards, and protecting everything that is rightfully yours. And in the blink of the eye, this sunken cost of so many artilleries being burst down is going to hit heavy into Kazva's vital ego. And Beastie just deleted a ton of his villagers. He's consistently above 100 army here. He's down to 59 wheels because he's understanding that if he wants to play with horsemen, he needs numbers. And oh boy, those numbers are showing up. He's now also playing with fire because his eco is now feeble as well behind this one. Uh -huh. But he's got the momentum now, I feel like. Look at the pings. Look, look, look at your map. Look at how many red pings are going off right now. The back of Kazza's primary base. Horsemen running rampant there. Central Island, man at arms, clubbing away at these small village accounts. On the west side, they were butchering through villages there, stopping reinforcements every time. BC is forcing Kazza's attention to five different fights all at once. And it's so much simpler for BC because he has this mobility of the horsemen. All he has to do is select them, A click. That's it. That's all that matters. Every once in a while, click them a little bit further away if you see spears showing up. But otherwise, just outmass your opponent and out Zerg him. You can tell this man came from a StarCraft background. And at the end of the day, it is 69 villagers. Very nice for Beastie, 88 for Kazva. But the concerning thing for Kazva is that he's pretty much depleted his resource banks, the 53 army, and his opponent. Beast is at 120 army still and still has 14,000 food and 5,000 food to work with. And now these horsemen are finally looking to start addressing the siege workshops, the bombards coming out. I mean, Kazva, this game is slowly but surely grinding towards a beastie victory. It just feels that he's relentless with this. And Kazva, never able to switch. He's invested so hard into the barracks that transitions are a delicate thing to try and undertake this stage. And if he tried to switch into stables himself, he'd leave himself exposed, which is why it's still nonstop just racks and siege. There's no change. And if you think of from beastie's perspective, how many transitions he made he started melee with siege basically copying kazva then uh like, well sorry no he started stables right then he switched into the melee then he switched into the range and now he's back harder into the stables this is just ridiculous from him the amount of transitions this man has made and if you ever thought it wasn't a big transition look in the southwest side of his base see how many stables are here this is how he keeps zerging this is a ludicrous amount of stables 16 in fact in the back of his base and he has the resources to make them work. That's the magical thing. You can have 16 stables if you don't have the resources. But boy, oh boy, does he have it. And he has a very, very consistent food eco as well still going on. So it's not even the fact that he's depleting his food bank anymore. He's just able to maintain that level of production with the eco he currently has. And he's just uh -huh. flooding his opponent with units. And look at the knock-on effect as well. You see what's actually up in the base of Kazva. It's not the horsemen anymore. It's the primary army, the quality hand cannon is in small groups to slay all these minor arms. Then the front line of MAAs and spearmen is just pushing Kazva back. This was the intent. BC, just a masterclass on how to juke and jive your opponent. He understands that with his slow static army, it's very hard to get across the map. But if you force your opponent to go there first, you can just follow wherever he goes. And that's exactly what he's done here. He just has Kazva dancing to his tune at every Every time. And as we said, a key part of Kasva's production is on the far left side. And look at just Kasva's wood bank. He's at the 200, 300 wood in the bank. Losing those barracks actually becomes much more amplified in this late game when you suddenly don't have any wood income. So you just can't replace those otherwise very expensive buildings. It's, it's ludicrous how much damage he's doing right here. I mean, like, everyone looks at the stage to see so many buildings, but as you said, with the wood being depleted, like, replacing these is impossible. 258 wood, even if he extracts all the remaining wood in his territory right now, it is negligible. He's been on straggler trees for a while. You can see as you look around in Kazza's base, this is looking grim fast. And the only hope he has is if he re-obtains control of this central island, which is why he's pushing out the villages and the man at arms now. And you're going to see a reaction. Straight away, Beastie's moving in with horsemen here. He can slay so many villages so quickly because they are so fast. And he's going for bombards. In this recent patch, the horsemen and the knights actually became better against siege weapons. So burning down those bombards is really no challenge for them. 
And on the left side, I feel like the breakthrough is imminent. And once those units get into Castle's base, Castle doesn't have the tools to stop them. Yeah, and you can just see, like, Gazva, he's harming the, the peasantry at this stage. The villagers have to contribute. They have to get through all these frustrating outposts that are being slapped down. And PC, he's been trading with the northern marketplace now, not very effectively as he gets butchered. But it doesn't matter. It's just a weird side benefit if you can have it. You still have ridiculous surplus food and wood, and that's really what's decided this game. Right, when you get this stage, it's it's not even gold is gold anymore. Wood is gold. And that is really what we've learned in, in this kind of matchup. I mean, despite the fact that you can have amazing games with Renix Cathedrals, how important that gold trickle can be. At this stage, sometimes it is just as simple as falling back to the normie horseman to just slay your opponent. And that's exactly what BC has achieved with this. And his resource bank is still looking very powerful, whereas for Kazva, he is just completely done. He has 86 villagers on food, but he's going to deplete those remaining straggler trees in just a matter of minutes, and he will be out of resource entirely. Behind this one, Beastie also has the sacred site on the south, so that's also an extra 100 gold per minute, and part of the reason why he's only um, about 160 gold per minute behind his opponent is because of that, so that's definitely something that helps compensate for that one less relic he has, and as you said, as the map is depleted of wood, Kazva's just gonna struggle to rebuild his production buildings or just to make any kind of army happen. It feels like BC has always been cost effective with what he's invested in, right? Like, if you think about his siege army now, it's just Maganels. He doesn't waste money on bombards. Like, other than these stone walls, he doesn't really need Maganels. Everything else just follows. Like, the butchering of all of the villages as Kazra's in trouble. Even the straggler trees look impossible. The army moving even deeper. And if this gets anywhere near your landmarks, they can blow them up in the blink of an eye. This is a lot of troops. Speaking of landmarks, though, this is what Kazra's going for. I feel like he feels the Post blood race. in the water. He's realizing that, okay, I got one shot over here. I need to go for those landmarks. And they are within reach, but there are so many mangonels set up there against all those light infantry units. Exactly. You've got one shot, but your opponent has seven. Seven mangonels just unloading heavily under Langstead, the man of arms and everything. And only bombards to back you up. And they have to go around the walls. This is so smartly played by BC. Quick wall on one side. It delays everything. And getting bodies in front of the Zerg means he can't get on the Maganels quick enough. His army is depleting too quickly. Meanwhile, his own base, the rush in. BC is in hardcore. Onto the farmlands. Kazva, everything is going to be shut down and grind to a halt. And this is looking like it's only going one way. And it's towards a second point on the board for BC because there's just nothing left for Kazva. Name BC the Skrull because he has been hoarding his nuts all game long and in the end he shows these nuts to Kazva and takes Danu River. Oh what an absolutely crazy game over here for a long time it seemed like Kazva's gonna take it but really back and forth game so many swings left and right really and there were some scary moments for both sides and even just five minutes ago we were talking about either of these players having an opportunity to win but ultimately, just the efficiency of Beastie is just showing in these. And despite the fact that Kazva maintained control over that central island for a longer time, despite the fact that he probably has a tremendous amount of gold advantage, indeed 20,000 more gold gathered by Kazva, the wood and food count is what swings this in the favor of Beastie. 20,000 more food, 20,000 more wood. And he just converted those to a just a tremendous amount of horsemen. And he was able to turn his resource bank into an army the moment he needed it. And that's probably the key thing here. He was banking up those resources throughout the game. And when it was really needed, he just sort of broke the bank, broke that piggy bank and just started to run with uh, all those resources, start piling up a massive army. Like you can see it on the military graph when he decides to, okay, I'm going to have to start using up my resource bank right now. Yeah, it was absolutely insane. I mean, Beastie, like, so many players in that situation, they would have been like, oh, I've got 15,000 wood. I'll just keep trading for gold. I need gold. I really need gold. But he understands that, like, resources all have their own balance of value as the game goes on. They're going to come back. We've seen so many hyper late game situations where wood is a definite factor because food, of course, is infinite. And then people just zerg horsemen. And BC was very wise about choosing his timing on this. He essentially just drained Kazva. He watched as Kazva time and time again kept investing in very weird artillery compositions. I feel like Kazva... I don't know, even know if I'd say it's desperation, but in some ways it looked desperate, right? The way you just kept kind of throwing unnecessary losses at these, these battles around the central island, feeling like each time, yo, I can kind of get in here. Oh, yo, like I've got an army of 50, but 10 of them might sneak into the, the, like the, the eco lines of my opponent. That's cool, but if you just take a note out of BC's base and wrap wider and play two sides of the map at the same time, 
all of a sudden, you don't have to sacrifice 80% of your military force to get in and do some serious damage. Instead, you maybe lose five and then make your way in so cleanly. And I think that's something that the Kazra, it was almost like midway through, he was learning this from Beastie, right? He's like, oh, yes. You know what? I, I know what I need to do now. I need to play both sides. And that was when we saw that switch up, right? And it only happened, not because it was such an effective idea in the grand scheme of things. I felt like the only reason Kazva done that was because he saw the neutral trade. That's the only reason he ever reacted on the West side. And I think that's a big weakness. It's very easy on Danny River to tunnel vision the central island. It is so important in so many matchups. But in this matchup, it almost felt moot and irrelevant because there was so many open flank attacks after Kazva taps his initial resources. And this can be a very big, powerful element to the early game of having that docked corner we talked about. But this is where in the late game, having that open starter point of being in the central side, uh, central point of your side is much more valuable. And we saw how Beastie exploited that. There was some very risky elements to his base formation, but you cannot deny the fact that he always had more space to expand to than Kazza ever did. And one of the things that was really missing for uh, Kasva is just leveraging that river control. He was the one controlling the river, but we haven't seen a single demolition ship. We saw like one Karak, and that was just desperately missing from him, especially late game when you had a lot of production buildings on the shoreline, or you just had windows to potentially blow up those siege weapons. Like, there were some instances where Beastie was crossing that river with infantry and siege weapons. Those are the windows that you can use to just sink those with demolition ships, and you just need one power spike like that to swing a bell in your favor. We barely saw any kind of combat ships added here from either side, but especially for Kazva, who technically won the river, it's insanely painful. It most definitely is. I mean, like, demo ships usually is the critical detail we're looking for. We talked about it. The whole character play was kind of interesting. I'm glad he didn't invest in more of them. I think when Barbards start to come into play, it becomes a little bit funky. But yeah, the fact that there was never demo ships showing in a game where there was only really artillery as a ranged unit for so long was a little bit surprising. Because you can actually sneak them pretty effectively behind walls as well, just to try and hold areas hostage. And I definitely think that the only reason we didn't see Kazza play towards it was because uh, most of the flanks attacks were coming from the west right like there was a lot of aggression on land so i think that made him feel safe that he never actually needed to uh, protect the crossings and then if you look at from beastie's side he was already pushed off the water in a very awkward way so that he could never go demo ships it's a very interesting game that we see a shift away from water simply because of the choice by one player to fixate on the western flank and the other one as a result of that just naturally gets uncontested control of the central island I think that's kind of what defined it. Even if you go demo ships as Kazza there, I think you still have that issue on the west flank. And I do think that if he goes demo ships, he does have the option to invest more in defending his west flank. But I don't know. It, to me, it just felt like Kazza never saw it as a problem, right? It was almost like, <laughs> I don't want to say delusional, but it almost felt like he did kind of just, you know, hunker down in his little, own little hole and pretend that he wasn't having his villagers butchered time and time again on the west flank. I think if I look back at that game, one of the big things I'd say Kazza could switch up if he was to play it again, is he needed to actually aggressively wolf forward earlier on in the west flank to just basically pad an expansion point for an additional wood line. I think once you reach that point where he depleted his secondary wood line and that opened up all those flank attacks, even if you don't talk about the cheesy sneak through on the walls that we saw from BC multiple times, you're still in a very fragile state where you've opened up a giant gap in your base and you have no easy way of maintaining and gaining ground because you haven't prepped walls in advance and you're playing a very static army formation that can't easily move across to defend your flank. Oof, man, but that, I, that was only game two, folks. Like, that's something you need to keep in mind here, that we are talking about a best of seven. Beastie is getting very close to winning, though. Only two more in a row and he's going to make this a clean sweep against Kazva. And Kazva needs to mix it up. He needs to switch it up. However, you have to question if that's going to be the case. As I just took a little, a little peeksies in on what's going to happen with game number three. It's going to be another mirror matchup. This time, both players playing as the Roos. Yeah, I was muted for like three minutes here, so I was just talking to myself. Oh. I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, we got, we got game three coming in. But as you said, it's a best of seven, but you get the feel that if Beast takes this one, it's going to be awfully hard for Kasva to come back uh, into this one. In fact, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that such a game, very, very long, grindy, and ultimately a game that Kasp was in a very good position with is mentally depleting for the players. So, especially for Kasva, losing this game is just an added level of frustration. And, you know, when you're down two games and you just lost an otherwise close game, oh, you might actually become a little more shaky-handed than usual. It's the fatigue as well, right? Like, I think a lot of people don't understand this because it, it just seems almost memeful, but it's actually been scientifically proven. Like the amount of endorphins, the, the kind of like rush that you get when you play at the highest level of play, 
uh, in esports is comparative to actual Olympic athletes playing in traditional sports. Seriously. Like, I, I talk to pros as well. Like, let's say they do a best of seven grand final. Every game goes like 40 minutes plus. They are actually exhausted at the end. They're drained mentally and physically. And that type of game, with the back and forth nature of it, with how you, once again, like, you, to highlight what you're saying, like, the morale hit, right? You thought you were in control. But also the fact it went so long and was so back and forth, so intense, so many things happening, has to be burning you at both ends of the candle in this situation. And you have to wonder, if this starts to, like, turn into a slog we end up going three four five six and into the seventh game with bc already being two ahead do we start to see that fatigue set in and i'm not just saying all this because kaza is an old man this can happen to even the young lads as well exactly the thing is that fatigue is there for both players but beast can at least say that hey i won the game as we jump into game number three it is border bay time not a map that we have seen very frequently a map that players sort of dislike for many reasons and we'll have up north Beastie playing as the Blue Rus. And down south, we're going to have the unconventional appearance of a yellow for Kazva over here playing as the Rus as well. Yes, that's because Kazva has had enough of getting the crap kicked out of him and has gone full anime and decided to go Super Saiyan. So that's what this is representing. This is a new <laughs> form of Kazva, one that will surely take full control of the series, Lytical, and give us somewhat of a competition because right now this is getting a little bit beastie favored with two points to the board for him and Kazva looking a little bit helpless. To pick Roos here on Boulder Bay, though, this is kind of standardized. It's kind of wacky. I think a lot of people are still kind of thinking that, that France is you know, king of Boulder Bay. Uh, but if you actually were to poll the top 100 players and ask them who they think the best Civ is on Boulder Bay, I would say about 80% of them would say Roos right now. Roos feel very powerful. And it's all about that transition immediately at the beginning of Feudal, converting as much of your fleet as possible. And the fact that you can get good bang for buck, because although Hulk's one-on-one -on -one are very good, if you reach a critical mass of these archer ships as the Roos, you outzerg your opponent, you block them off entirely, and you easily escalate this game into an easy dub. The thing with the Rus is that the magical play for them on water is that they can always balance the amount of combat ships and fishing ships they make because they just make fishing ships and only convert the required amount into combat ships. With any other sieve, you have to make a decision. If I add a fishing ship here, it means I'm not making a combat ship. So if you mess up that balance, you are done. You either don't have a good water eco or you will just fall behind in ship numbers. But when it comes to the Rus, you can only convert, or you can convert your fishing eco to combat ships whenever needed. And you can just wait until you actually need it and just use them as fishing eco. In fact, if you win the water, you can even convert them back to fishing ships. So that flexibility on the, on the water makes them one of the most appealing choices in these uh, water heavy maps over here. And it looks like we do not have a dock being placed here by Beasties. So he's got something else on his mind. Or am I blind? Okay, am I blind? There's a dock yeah, on the right he, side. He... Yeah, he went for like, it's, it's kind of a debate because, well, for a start, he didn't have good like deep fish, but also Kaz was not going to look here, whereas he'll look to the west first. But just to kind of recap on what you were saying, for anyone who like kind of lost track of that in the middle of it, convert, 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 convert more than a priest yelling wall lol <laughs> is kind of the, the name of the game on the sea for the roost. It's very powerful. Um, one cool thing we haven't really seen utilized too much, it rarely actually comes into the equation for the roost, is if you do solidify control on the waterfront, you can actually not only convert like your attack ships back to the fishing boats, you can convert them to trade ships as well. We don't really see Roos playing to trade, but it is kind of an, a, an optimized way to kind of shift across to a trade-based eco. Something that I'd be excited to see because I never get to see it with Roos. Even when we get like, you know, full control, quadruple drop docks, them dropped where BCs put them, they still never consider it. It's almost like, unless you have that extra leverage of say what the French have around their sea trade, no one wants to actually do it. So we'll see if that so comes weird. into play though. It's yeah, so it weird, like, right? I've, I've been asking players why they're not doing that because it's an insane amount of resource income. Like, the travel distance between your docks and this neutral trade post is quite big. So, even if you're not playing the French, that trade brings its investment back really fast, and it's a very difficult uh, place to raid for your opponent. So, it's actually very surprising that uh, most players are not going for trade at all on the water. Probably not early game, but once you secure the water control, adding a couple of trade ships can actually boost your eco quite a bit. I wonder if they're like paranoid about the fact it costs two pop cap, maybe? Because like I think the, the the logic is like you you use trade to scale into late game, right? So the fact that you use two pop cap out is like you need it in ultra late game situations. But when you're talking like between that 30, 40 minute mark, it almost feels like it's just a detriment to be spending two of your pop cap per one of these ships. I don't think like it's a bad trade. Like if we'd actually like 
average out the travel time and the return resources, I think it's a good investment. But it might even just be something as simple as the initial investment of 400 resources is far too high. Because that is actually an insane amount to pay for an eco unit in Age of Empires. Now, there is a difference in the approach of the two players. Kazu is aging up with the Golden Gate, allowing him to sell the gold or sell the food that he has oh, wow. accumulated. Whereas on the other side, there's a Kremlin coming in for Beastie, and the Feudal Age is much faster for Kazva. Beastie's in trouble because those fishing ships are about to be converted to combat vessels. Yeah, this is going to be problematic. Beastie's going to have to duck and dive away from this, but Kazva, he sees this. The scout, it snitched on everything. He knows where he's going as he converts his fleet. This is going to be problematic. Now, the, the important part about why Beastie done this, by the way, is because he's looking to optimize his fishing, uh, his, his boat fleet. Because remember, they cost more wood than gold. So he wants to be able to convert more of them more quickly and stay ahead. The problem is he's taking such heavy hits already to his fishing boats as he tries to convert over. Remember, this takes 20 seconds, so you're going to lose a few. And he instantly calls GG. He gets spotted out. He gets snitched on. And that is enough to finally give Kazu a point. I guess Super Saiyan mode really does work. Easy clap, as the saying goes. Well, that game, wow. I think we had one unit killed. Yeah, Kazma won this game with one unit killed out here. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> and it just turns out to be, like, this is the reason why players don't play this map very often. It's just very punishing, especially in these Roost Mirrors. Just imagine the French doing this. The French can't do this. They need to make a combat ship. As they uh, reach Feudal Age, that combat vessel, the Hawk, has to sail all the way up. The opponent can sail away, but... When it comes to these Lodja ships, you can push your fishing eco up already, and the moment you hit Feudal Age, you have your window to convert them and start pushing your opponent. And really, it just came down to the fact that Kaz has a slightly better optimized build order in Dark Age. He beat his opponent to Feudal Age by like 25 seconds, and ultimately, that's enough to give him the power spike. And Beastie knows very well that the moment he loses water, he's screwed, especially because he even went up in the Kremlin. So, it's not like he's getting a gigantic boost from, uh, let's say, the Golden Gate for some sort of fast castle play and then push yeah. on land. Like, the Kremlin, of course, would boost his wood income, but what are you even going to do with wood in Feudal Age if you don't have the water? Exactly. I mean, like, honestly, Kazva won that game, but I'm, I'm wondering if we do give the point to him or to whoever designed the map seed generation, because it has to be highlighted that the Deepwater Fish were not well situated for Beastie. He had no flexibility, had no options. That's why he went so far to the east. He could have went west, but like we said, that's probably, like, you're gambling, but likely Kazu's going to look on the left before he looks on the right. So you're essentially just trying to cover yourself by a little bit more time. The reason that Beastie goes into the Kremlin is because of that choice. He knows he's behind. He knows the only way he's going to be good is if he pads this, gets into Feudal, and then is able to push more of these fish, uh, these fishing boats and these uh, archer ships. That's one of the big edges, because remember, like, if you build a Kremlin, Yes, you're missing out on the scalability as minutes go on with the Golden Gate, but what you get in return initially is you get a free wooden fortress, which means you're getting 20% more wood dropped off very quickly. And the whole idea is when you're in a mirror matchup, what it usually comes down to is if both of you are doing the exact same thing and everything else is the same, it's like who has that slight lead in X or Y, right? Like, can I get one more ship out, two more ships out? And I think that's what BC was aiming for, realizing that because he got such a crappy map seed generation to start with, there wasn't really another choice. If you go Golden Gate, you're trailing in this game. And that means you're also then going to be forced to probably forfeit the waterfront. And really, that is too big of a deal. I mean, even after the nerfs, it feels like the deep water fish are still just so damn good. And I've highlighted the biggest problem you have to consider is not even the fact that, like, the fishing rates were just outright broken. Like conceptually, the idea of what makes water good is the fact that you're able to create a secondary TC for 150 wood. That's how you have to imagine it. Yes, you pay a little bit more for these fishing boats, but because they gather at a better rate, they basically pay for the additional cost over a villager. Meanwhile, you are having a second building that constructs resource generating units. That is so invaluable. And I think it's why being locked out of water is still such a very oppressive element of Age of Empires 4, and one that we still haven't really cracked from a design perspective. 100% agreed with that. The thing is that at this point, if you don't go water, you are done. And ideally, on a hybrid map situation, you would have to make a decision whether you go for water or not. This being said, we are almost ready to go into game number uh, three. And I get the feel that as much as mentally depleting the game two was for Kasva, this has to be a sigh of relief for him. An easy win, not something that's uh, exhausting. 
and he just got one game. So, you know, he was grinding very hard for that game number two, ultimately ends up losing, and there is just that bitterness in you when you grind so much for a game and then you end up losing it. As I said, fatigue is kicking in, but your opponent is the one taking the uh, point for that game. And then, in just a couple of minutes, you just strike back, and uh, now it's a 2-1. So I feel like this is actually like a mental reset for Kazva as we jump into game number four. Yeah, so I think the really big thing to speak to here is like, you said it's like a morale booster for Kazva. I think it's actually frustrating for both players. Players want to play a good game, right? They want to feel like they earned the game. And I think there is going to be kind of a cruel in Kazva's mind when a game ends at five minutes. Like, what, how much of that was mean? How much of that was something else? Now, he will be happy. It's a point nonetheless, right? It helps. It's a booster. You need to start coming back. But I think Kazva is just going to be as frustrated as DC is here. He's like, I want to actually like beat him on fairly even terms to prove I'm the better player. And this is where he's going to try to do it. We shift on the Lipany in game number four. The point system right now, two on the board for VC, one for Kazva. And Kazva, as a result, now looking to even up as he will whip out the Mongols on Lepany and it'll be against Beastie playing as England. Ooh, this is a tough one for Beastie if you think about that. We've talked about this multiple times. The English is a good civilization for Lepany. It's the open map that has quite a lot of cliffs around, so you don't need as much mobility as you need on Dry Arabia or Hiveview or something like that. But the problem with the English here is that in many ways, this civilization is a little too heavy on the archer department, whereas the Mongols have insane flexibility. They can play horsemen, they can just flood you with archers. So you get the feel that the civilization here is slightly more favorable for Kazva. Although, you never know, we might see something crazy like what we've seen from Mista yesterday trying to go for the English horsemen. I feel like I... I am I... Am I playing Age of Empires or as a Civ, is there any sort of like natural bonuses you get for like having the Himalayas nearby your civilization? Because this is one of the funkiest rock formations I think I've witnessed on Lepany. I don't know if you noticed it to the west of, of Kazwa's base. <laughs> what is this? It's like the most redundant mountain I've ever seen on a Lepany generation. I just, I, I had to highlight it because I, I don't think I see this very often. It's kind of crazy. Um, it almost feels like half of this rock line should be on the other side of the map. But no, def definitely a fair point what you were saying about like the England Mongol matchup. I think when you're talking Lipany, the details you're looking at straight away, we're always looking to see if someone got a choke point focus. Nobody got a choke point focus. In fact, if someone had been placed where that stone outcropping is near the big mountain line, then that would be a jackpot for England. That's the most defendable location I've ever seen. Uh, but of course, both of them are, are pretty exposed. Of course, Kazva has to worry about his north side and BC has to worry about both the north and the south side. So the other detail we're then looking for is the stealth forest. Is the stealth forest bulky? Is it critical? Is it scary? I'd say the stealth forest is fairly scary. And as a result, I think the person who gets an outpost down in this area first will have a huge buffer to their chances of winning this because it's so much vision game in a critical area that would either force a mobile player to go very wide or obviously a static player would struggle to get through here entirely. And Lombos are fantastic when they have that additional range to see you coming, right, with the vision. But at the same time, if you're able to see where the Lombos are in these shrubbery lines and they can't see you coming, you can rush them with horsemen and catch Beastie entirely off guard. Precisely. The thing is that the stealth forest is just amplified in importance because, as you said, it is right between the two players and... Kazva has his Ovu very much exposed on the front as well, so that is definitely a target for Beastie. Otherwise, Kazva's eco will be very compact. He's got the forest and the gold mine very close to his base. Bear is outlying a little further away, but there's also a safe hunt here to work with. So Kazva has to be happy with the base layout he has, but that Ovu is a little concerning for him. And in fact, he's dropping a defensive tower close to that Ovu, not something that you see every day. I think you need it in this game because I was going to say one of the risks is that Beastie spots this generation and he drops an outpost right at the edge of the Stealth Forest. And it gives him such a great staging point because you can't do anything. Like we talked about how important Uvus are. If you're playing Mongols and you're not playing around your Uvu, you're not playing Mongols. You're playing, I don't know, like Doggles. Like you're a crap version of Mongols. You just don't function. It's all about boosting your early game military presence without sacrificing your economy. So that's why it's important that he never surrenders this area of the map. But this is still something that Beastie can leverage, right? If he actually moves forward with an outpost, if he gets seven, eight, nine of these Lombos out, the cool thing about having an outpost aggressively placed at the front near the opponent's base is it's not just about the attack speed. When you have small quantities of Lombos, it's actually a safe fallback point. And it's very hard for Kazva to burn it to the ground in the initial stages with such small counts of troops. Defensive tower is up over here for Kazva. He's been harassing the villagers on that council hall for some time. But he really wasn't able to do that much damage, of course, with that Dark Age Khan. Now trying to deliver some hits on that scout. But really, 
the healing rate of those scouts is actually comparable to the damage output of the Dark Age Khan, so you really can't do much against that, as the two players are about to hit Feudal Age at approximately the same time. Slightly faster for Beastie, as we got another tower being dropped this time around by Beastie, and look at that position here. That being yeah. on the hilltop will give him a tremendous amount of line of sight, and if you look at that position, there is also sort of a cliff in front of that, in a way that there is a very narrow crossing, mm -hmm. so it's acting as a perfect natural checkpoint or choke point out there for uh, Beastie. Yeah, this is what I was looking for. Like, the whole idea of putting one forward now that you see that the output has been dropped is a little bit too risky. This, on the other hand, it's very hard for Beastie to lose it because Kazva has to run under the range of it and then run around in circles essentially to try and reach it. Even if he tries to move through that small choke point you talked about, he can only funnel his troops through slowly, so it delays you further and further. And you'll notice the other detail. BC's not done there. He's going to wrap to the west. The whole idea is to set up that network. We talked about how these are like the kings of outpost making in previous series, right? We've seen this. They do it differently, though. The Mongol player wants to condense it. He wants to press you. He wants to close you in very quickly and, and kind of suffocate you. While when it, you talk about England, it's not as much about the suffocation as it is kind of ironically about putting you in a pen and making you a sheep on a farm, right? He just wants to herd you in. He wants to keep you boxed in. He wants to dictate the flow, say where you can and cannot go, and then eventually arrive to take you to the slaughterhouse and butcher you. So that's what Beastie's looking for. He just wants that initial network that is wide enough that Kazza feels happy and safe. But as we know, with the poor sheep, they might look happy on their farms, but when they suddenly get taken into the slaughterhouse, everything gets a little bit sad and a little bit real. Kazza is using his that scout and con to overlook the base of his opponent, which under normal circumstances would be a great idea. You want to know what your opponent is up to. But this time around, by having both of those uh, scouting units up front, he isn't going to be able to see that tower coming up behind his wood line, so he'll be completely blind about it. There's a stable coming up, and a second is also being built, so Spearman will be needed for Beastie, but he's going to have a tower to fall back to just behind that wood line. Yeah, and that's the, the other cool thing, why you see a lot of these England players pad the outpost together. In this initial phase of the game, when you've got like between 5 and 10 Lombowmen, just having two close by outposts, you like you split them and you run them and you hide them inside the outposts. And although Horsemen have better armor at the moment, it, you're not going to feel confident, and you're going to feel very kind of lackluster after you lose the Khan like that. That movement speed would be really important for gap closing quick enough. You did also see Beastie kind of being funky with the palings. I don't know if he's going to try and experiment with it. I feel like a lot of English players just avoid it because it's so finicky to use, but I feel like that's actually the way you level up your England in the next step, is if you can get really good at utilizing palings, because it's such an underrated element of this unit that gives a lot of protection against these early horsemen. The stables and, in general, the Ovu being exposed is actually an absolute pain for Akazva right now. He's struggling to get that second stable up. And, as you see, he's got the stone in the bank right now, but we're not seeing more horsemen come in. And that's just giving such a big window for Beast to react. In fact, there's already a proxy barracks for him. And those longbows yeah. are just there to start picking up villagers, especially on the pastures, because it's not even the wood line that's going to be the target. It's going to be just marching close to those pastures and picking off the food villagers. Yeah, this is actually really impressive. I like what he's doing. I feel like a lot of players, they rush this outpost forward and they don't double down on it. But when you're playing England, if you get these outposts in place, you should be double down. This is your win condition. So it's actually remarkable the, the way that he's done this. Now he's actually going to have a quick reinforce point, a fallback point, and he doesn't have to rely on the garrison and outpost, which means he can continue to scale the Lombo count without being threatened by these horsemen. And these horsemen are going to get uncomfortable quickly when they see the racks and they're playing around these choke points where the spears so easily and trivially buffer them off. That's the other detail. All of these buildings, are now just choke points to funnel through these annoying horsemen. And the thing is that you have double stables, so you're fully committed towards horsemen, but you don't have an answer to the spears. If you were playing something like French, you might just be able to overpower your opponent with knights um, as against the spearmen. But with your horsemen, you won't be able to fight effectively against spears, so you need some sort of component that's able to deal with the spears. Instead, it looks like Kaz was just going to relocate his army and try to go for a counterattack. One of the drawbacks of having a four barracks is that you won't be able to respond to the horsemen counterattacking you. But I feel like if Beast is able to get a defensive barracks up as well, and just get a couple of spears going to defend his base with, he's going to have this game. Yeah, this is the risk of proxy basing, right? This is actually really well played by Kazva. I would have preferred to have seen two or three horsemen move to the south because these longbows have been running through unimpeded for a long time. And Kazva, as you can see the scout now fighting, has had vision of it the entire time and allowed it to continue. But instead, he goes towards diving the base. He'll force them off the goal, but I don't think you care. Beastie doesn't actually need a tech up. 
He just needs to close the game now. And because you're allowing him to get another outpost this close to your TC, this game is about to get incredibly uncomfortable for Kazva. It also denies him for easily moving across and defending his military expansion. Right now, this outpost is really all that stands between Beastie and Victory. And those arrow slits are just coming in clutch right now for Kazva. If it wasn't there, that tower would be gone, and so would be the stables and the Ovu. And that would be the end of Kazva. And the thing is that the moment Kazva has to return to defend, it's an absolute disaster for him. Because as we talked about this, he can't take this fight right now. He's got uh, about 10 horsemen against 6 hardhead spearmen, soon to be 7. And soon he's going to have issues accessing food. Whereas for Beastie, as long as he's able to just make sure he doesn't lose a tremendous amount of villagers to those horsemen, he's going to be fine. And Beastie, although he cannot see the horsemen in the stealth forest... I get the feel that he knows the air approximate location, so he knows exactly that he isn't going to get pushed in the next couple of seconds. Yeah, he knows, like, basically the only choice you have to try and sneak up on Beastie is to go for his base again. And that's what Kazva's going to look to do, is he wraps to the south side this time. But the TC is here, remember, although you have that additional ranged armor, it's double the arrows coming out from England. In the meantime, arrows coming out plenty from the Lombos, they're slowly poking and prodding their way through stables. It will take a while, but this pressure adds up over time. And every once in a while, he sees a villager poking out and easily picks him apart. But Kazva, now I'm going to try and raid in. Actually, he might have timed this perfectly. Beastie's about to expose his woodline. So you might get some injuries in onto the English village account, but it's going to be hard to get a definitive blow. It indeed is going to be hard. There are some longbows as well, and their rate of fire is also increased in the aura. So there is one villager going down. But every horseman that Kazva loses is going to be increasingly difficult to replenish because his eco is under so much pressure. You see, he's venturing out to the berries to the north right now, trying to salvage something out of this. But the siege engineering oh upgrade is already God. coming in. And so many dead horsemen. And look at the detail that matters here. Another outpost goes down. Kazva, he's just being put into prison. He's barely got anywhere to run and hide anymore. As you said, the siege engineering is soon to come out. And this is looking all up for BC at the moment. I don't even know if Kaza really has anything left. I mean, the horseman army is more or less depleted. Even Lombos are standing and fighting. They just don't care. The Khan gets picked off as well. This villager line to the east is very risky. You see a double archer range being dropped now. But I feel like you're running out of time fast. The scout, I don't think he saw it. Look, look at the vision on the scout from Beastie. He almost spots out the girt. If he ever sees that, this game is going to be lights out for Kazva. And I think he might have seen it. We'll find out in the coming moments. Uh, it's yeah, really that's, tough. that's a big question mark. If he sees those lumberjacks, it's probably game over. Ranges are coming up, but this point, the numbers advantage is just so much in the favor of Beastie. He's got 22 army as opposed to zero. And Kazva's going to need a lot of time to get those archers going. Oh, no. And I think it's just going to be a flat out siege push towards those berries. Yeah, Kazfa has the eyeballs on this. He sees what is obnoxiously being built on his base and calls GG without hesitation. What a play coming out from Beastie. Now to put himself up once again, two points over Kazva at the score will update the 3-1. He shows us exactly how England can dominate Mongols. And this time, unlike yesterday, there were never horsemen to be seen for the English player. This must be very painful for Kazva once again, because this was a super dominant victory here for Beast. Like, that wasn't even a question. Like, the only thing that Kasva could have done is maybe he tried to hope that those horsemen can kill more villagers than they did. But really, aside from that, there was not a single moment in this game where Kasva had momentum. Beastie was just imposing his will on his opponent, and now he's moving to match point. And that's just going to add another level of pressure to Kasva. We're going to Mongolian Heights, and remember that he doesn't have Delhi here, nor does he have Mongols. So... There is also a bit of a question mark with the civilization available. He already used up Delhi and Mongols, whereas Beast still has Delhi. Well, it's kind of crazy. Like, like I think we talked about how kind of funky the Delhi opening was going to be for Kazva. Although Kazva, like, if he goes up against Delhi here on Mongolian Heights, we actually saw him yesterday dominate his opponent with England versus Delhi. So that's also a possibility still for Kazva. I think just like glazing over that that last game, one really important thing to highlight uh, because we might see England again. I think it's actually all relevant is that like, the, the difference between good England players and great England players is exactly what Beastie presented here. It's very easy for me to say that after a win. Let me explain what I mean by it, though. A lot of England players in these type of games, they open up on someone like Lippany, they look around, they go, how defendable is my location? I'm up against an aggressive sieve. You want to find your aggressive timings, but you get paranoid about the ability to defend your own base. Beastie is proving exactly why he is such a 
golden tier England player because he gets into this game. His concern immediately is not with defenses. It's with aggression. He looks around. He goes, where can I drop an outpost aggressively? What can I do here? How exposed is he on one front or this other? Oh, his, his Uvu? Very far away from his base. So his economy and military is separated. Can I actually put a wedge between those two? It's all about how he escalates. Same with that proxy racks being dropped. Every detail about this game, every time, BC is just thinking, what can I do to him? Not what is he going to do to me? And it's very hard, even at a high level play, for people to think with that mindset when you're playing against Mongols with a very static force such as the English. Really fantastically done by him, though. And I just loaded in. We've got about three minutes out until the next game starts. As you said, it's going to be a Mongolian Heights. And it looks like it is actually going to be Delhi, as you were mentioning, versus the England that I was highlighting from Kazva. Kazva, of course, definitely looking strong after his performance yesterday to round out the day uh, when he beat Delhi as England. But this is a, a different beast altogether. Literally, right? BC is <laughs> is not the same as Ho Defex, and I don't expect to see the same. This is going to be a lot harder of an egg to crack. Indeed. And also, an added thing to discuss is that compared to yesterday, where all the sets were played one after another, the players didn't really have the time to check out the recorded games or just the casted games from their opponents. While uh, if a player really wanted to prepare for today, they can check out the games that were played yesterday and just take a look at what exactly their opponents did. So there is some extra preparation compared to yesterday because you had the window, you had the time to look at what your opponents or what your potential opponents were doing in the previous rounds of the qualifier. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, that, that's all like watching real is a really big part of, of being like a player, a cast or anything. I mean, like, I know a lot of people think that people just play the game, that we just play the game. No, we spend more time just like the players watching other players because when you get the highest level, that's that's very much how you learn and how you learn to overcome your upcoming um, issues, right? Which is going to be facing off against players deeper in the run. So learning from the best and then learning how to exploit the best is a critical detail. And I think Kazva, like we've seen the kind of the, the, the English trick and how he exactly wants to play it. One it, critical detail I'm going to be looking towards is whether Beastie is going to like play into the fishing boats, the when he knows how England plays against this, and especially he knows how Kazza plays against this. Beastie is definitely a very talented player at Mongolian Heights. It's kind of fitting in line with him being a, an expert Mongol player previously. I think it's one of his strongest maps. So I'm intrigued to see if he just does hard commit into the fishing line like so many Delhi players do, or if he's going to give this a completely different turn of angle that we wouldn't see coming. Maybe just rushing horsemen and playing directly on the land to just force Kazva into an uncomfortable situation. As a reminder, anyone that's failing to qualify this weekend is going to have a chance to retry next weekend. So one of these two players will probably have to retry next weekend because only one of these will qualify for the main event. There is eight spots in the LAN event of M4C, uh, out of which there are two invitees, Viper and the Muslim. And uh, we will have three players qualifying today from the first qualifiers and three more will qualify during the qualifiers next weekend. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to think uh, how much StarCraft representation there could be at this rate, right? Like, you know, you've still got Vortex, who's in the mixer. Uh, of course, we are talking about Beastie here. The Muslim already qualifying. I mean, I, you got to be careful. Marine Lord also in the mixer as well. At this rate, the Age of Empire lads might once again just be outnumbered by the Craft lads in the first big land. But you know what? We're getting ahead of ourselves. We need to resolve this series first, which means we are going to get into game number five between BC and Kazva as we take to the Mongolian Heights. Spawning in on the left side, we're going to have Beast deploying as the Delhi Sultanate in blue. And to the right, it is going to be Kazva handling the English in red. Seems fitting, right? Like, I, I, ne I never like these games where you get in and for some reason England's blue. It's not right, you know? <laughs> Especially when it's France versus England. There's just some, like mentally in my mind, it's like a blocker. I'm like, something's gone wrong with the generation here. Not the map generation, just the Civ generation. But yeah, straight away, we are going to see a shift out. So BC is going to move out and drop that dock. One detail I expect very different from his build order compared to what we saw yesterday from Ho Defex in this matchup. I expect him to be dropping an outpost quicker than what we saw out of Kazva's last opponent because he understands this matchup. BC has done this countless times by now. Mongolian Heights specifically, he understands that like if one Civ isn't designed to play onto the Docklands, he's going to look to counter your Dock play. So you need to prep a defense for that. Exactly. In fact, a preemptive tower behind that uh, Dock would actually be immensely helpful. Um, So far, it looks like we have uh, two scouts for Kazva. I only count one scout at this point for Beastie, though. Of course, the player that's not prioritizing the water is going to focus oh. on collecting sheep a lot more. But Beastie has to be happy with the amount of sheep that he's able to collect. In fact, there's a second scout for him, although that's very unsuccessful yes. collecting sheep. 
yeah, he sent it all the way to the back. He went for a little bit unorthodox of a move. Like, he shifted along the coast and, weirdly enough, found none on the southeast side of the map. But then he's looking to shift into, like, his own back lens to find a few. I like the move in, the snaky move. The amount he's taken away from Kazra, actually, just this one scout has already gathered up 13 sheep, which is just nuts. Very important, this matchup as well, because if you're stripping any of this away from Kazva, it cripples his timing. Because we said that when you play England, you don't play Doc, which means you're heavily reliant on these sheep to boost your eco until you're prepped for a farmland switchover. So actually a really big detail that he snatched away so many sheep from Kazva's side of the map. Indeed. Like, Kazva's got seven trailing him. He's probably going to have like eight or so, but underneath his town center, there is none. And on the other side of the map, that scout is also carrying just three. So Kazva isn't going to be super disappointed with the amount of sheep that he gathered. But if you compare it to what Beastie was able to acquire and you combine it with the fact that he also has the fishing eco, Beastie's got a great head start against his opponent, and really, it was a great move from him to push the scout to Kazva's side and just focus on stealing as much from Kazva as possible, and they just focus on his side of the river at a later time. Now, Beastie, I expect him in, like, the next minute to start constructing outposts. For the moment, he just wants to churn out enough of these fishing boats. He understands that he shouldn't have to race this outpost too quickly because Kazva shouldn't actually be prioritizing his own. So... You know, at this point, I think everyone kind of knows the timing they're looking at for an England player to crack feudal. You want to prep the outpost for about 20 seconds before the average so that you definitely get the outpost complete and it won't be denied. And if you can get it right near where this stone outcropping is on the east side, it essentially protects your entire fishing eco and there's not really any way that Kazva can assassinate these ships. Council Hall just now coming in here for Kazva, whereas for Beastie, of course... Uh, he is not going up to Feudal Age yet. There's a big investment um, for his fishing eco. And as he said, there's the tower coming in. He knows that timing. He needs to know that the English will reach Feudal Age at around that four minute mark. So you got to start constructing your outpost a tiny bit before that. Just to make sure that you maximize the amount of fishing ships that you have. But also make sure that uh, you have that tower going up. And that tower is vital. Because that is going to prevent the longbows from harassing you. Although there might be an angle that they could potentially use. Like... To the right of that stone, might, you might be able to harass the fishing ships and be outside the range of that tower. Yeah, it's kind of funky. It feels like BC is trying to protect the northern fishing points as well. I think that's why he's gone for this kind of like half-half situation. He probably could have actually postured this outpost a bit further forward. Kind of surprised he didn't actually. But I guess he just wants to keep kind of congested close to the coastline. He might drop a second outpost to the south. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised this village is going to do this on the southern side of the crossing right now. That should deny any easy access, but... For the moment, he's just going to continue to churn out those boats because, of course, you always want to keep non-stop production out of your dock. And um, obviously, we always do expect the player not playing dock to actually reach feudal a lot quicker. It's why England does this, because England really is about how fast can I get feudal. And when you play these water hybrid maps, you know you're going to be over a minute, probably easily over two minutes ahead of your opponent in terms of the tech up. And the whole idea is maximizing the efficiency of your Lombo early to exploit that detail. Kazva up to Feudal Age, and he's going to start pumping out those longbows. Whereas on the other side, Beastie is uh, about to go up. He already has a mosque up, so he started to get uh, efficient production. And once he gets that, and he gets to Feudal Age and starts pumping out the archers, that's where things could get a little concerning for English. Because the Delhi, we have seen that it's so powerful as a civilization, even on open maps like Arabia. Give them an untouched fishing eco, and they will be absolute juggernauts. Yeah, and while you can touch the fishing eco for the moment, like BC has some safe farm because this is the this is why he done this outpost play. Oh, I'm being fired upon by these lombos. I'm gonna shift to the north side. This is actually really smartly played. It's actually next level. A lot of players would have put it one side of the others we've talked about. The reason he doesn't do it in this situation is because well, these outposts wouldn't be able to snipe the Lombos. The Lombos would easily still be able to snipe the fishing boats. So this kind of gives a leverage balance where you shift across the other side and all of a sudden these Lombos have to run all the way around the AoE uh, range of the the outpost to reach your fishing boats again. Well, at the moment, they're doing a damn good job of slowly picking apart these fishing boats. Won't be quick enough to sink even one, though. But the outpost is established, so Kazva should have a way across, and he will look to probably get very aggressive off the back of this, understanding that timing around what we've been talking about with Delhi, which is using the military efficiency, and they start to come online very hard and can actually outscale the English. One fishing ship goes down over here. Gotta love the move that you garrison the two scouts you have in that tower. You don't want to waste the villagers doing that. So you just go for the scouts garrisoned into the tower. And it looks like the fishing ships were trying to intercept those archers crossing the river. Oh, wow. 
Feudal Age is almost in for Beastie, but he's in a bit of a troublesome spot because those gold and stone miners are wide open to the longbows to kill. Yeah, and you really have nothing to defend them with right now. So now you need, you've got the tech up, but you need to get either stable or archery range. I really want to see stable in this situation. I think you just need to play tempo control with your yep. speed to just essentially play defensive against the Lombos and then flank attack to the north and the south forwards because you do have a lot of influence now because you can see that Kazva is hard invested in this central crossing. Although you can't deny him there, you can outmaneuver him. And that is why Kazva instantly drops the racks, not in his base, but at the crossing so he's able to reinforce quickly and has a safe fallback point. Yeah, that's a great position. So he's sort of doing the same thing that Beast did to him in the previous game. It is much easier to reinforce, and really the best way to avoid a counterattack from Beastie with the Horseman is just to force the issue yourself, pressure your opponent. Beastie was mining some stones, so he probably can get arrow slits on his towers, but the Longbow is also finding a beautiful angle to get behind the fishing ships here. Perfect placement this for Kasva. Is, this is worst case scenario, right? Like... You were prepped for the Lombos on their side of the river, but now that they're here, you don't have any outposts to defend yourself. You're being picked apart, and you've got so many fishing boats that can be exploited as Kazva continues to snipe them out and force them up north. You're going to need to react very soon. The good news, at least for Beastie, is he has a lot of sheep underneath his TC. So losing this expansion isn't going to stun him entirely, but it is definitely slowing him because I don't really feel like he got the full return on investment he was looking for initially pushing into these fishing boats. And because he's getting forced away from his gold mine as well, he can't even afford a Dao to add some beef to that navy because the fishing ships, while they can fire arrows, they're not particularly powerful once you match up against this many longbows. But if you could get one or two Daos on that uh, water side, you could do a ton. And now the horsemen will be able to catch those longbows off guard. This could be a great fight for Ka Beastie. Yeah, this is what I was waiting for. This is the critical detail. The horsemen moving in, maybe a little bit prematurely. If they were here as four, it would be even quicker. But they will clean up in the end, and this will get rid of that annoying fawn on your side. Kazva doesn't have that patrol force on your side of the bank anymore. And it's unlikely he's going to do it again anytime soon, because you've shown horsemen. He will, however, have the thumbs up that going into the racks was the right call, and he will now start to prep those spearmen. But this is where you're starting to leverage that fishing eco. At this point, it's 600 food per minute for Beastie, so while a couple of fishing ships were taken down, ultimately Kazva loses a significant portion of his forces, and we are getting to the stage of efficient production indeed. We're seeing that already come in for Beastie. He's got the sheep working for him, and he's got the fishing eco working, and there is just no sign of him trying to just play this one slow and get to Castle Age. I think he wants to go full feudal at this point. Yeah, you can feel like he's got a strong arm point to leverage from, like, especially when you see this rack dropped on the forward, you can see his plan. He moves in with the Horseman. The Arrow Slits upgrade hasn't even come out yet. This could actually be devastating for Kazva. Chase in past the one Spearman onto the Lombos. We'll turn around to address that now. Yes, you get bonus damage, but you have to last long enough to really get the value, which is why he prioritizes it out. More Spearmen are at least being produced. Horsemen aren't really addressing the key issue, which is the Lombos. And I feel like Beastie, he has achieved his goal here. Look what he's doing on the crossing. He just wanted to buy time, buffer the attention, and then get his own walling down. The problem is the arrow slits upgrade is going to be there, and his villager is going to be sniped out before he walls it off entirely. Yeah, that's an absolute pain for him at this point. He needed that walling to be done, or at least set up the foundation so units can't just freely cross. He's going to limit the movement of the opponent, so it's not going to be as easy as it used to be to cross the river. And he managed to wall off the north as well. South is also walled off, so he nearly managed to wall off the entire river, let alone that uh, two tiles out there. But the problem for him, as you said, is that those two tiles that are still open could actually prove fatal. Yeah, the question now is whether BC, off the back of this, decides that it's actually better value to invest in a second dock and escalate his eco. That is an option available to him now that he's secured the northern forward, which means he always has a way for the horsemen to wrap around the back and punish the Lombos for just trying to snipe out these boats. We'll see if he does that in probably the next minute. I think if he doesn't drop a dock by, say, like 11 and a half minutes, he's just going to be full, like, land hoy ahead. And with the archer range being dropped, that does look like that's going to be the case in the back of his base. Blacksmith already up for Beastie as well. He's coming in with the upgrades. Uh, currently has no scholar garrison in those mosques out here. Where did those scholars go? He's, oh yeah, they're camping. going for the sacred site. And Wolf is there, the bite infantry, chewing away at that scholar. But the horsemen will be there to save him. So no harm done. Hey, plenty of harm done. That's that's 30 health. He's, nah, he'll be fine. Um, can you imagine if, like, if, if actually guy infantry got upgraded as they killed people? Like a kind of promotion thing, like you're playing an RPG. <laughs> like, yeah, Bitey Infantry killed three troops. Okay, now it's like Swall Bitey Infantry. It does eight damage per bite. 
Man, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm just trying to complicate Age of Empires. I mean, you, you know, I come from a MOBA background. I've got this obsession with like Warcraft and Dota. I, I want it. I, I want to level them up. Promotions, like Red Alert style. You kill enough troops, all of a sudden you get promoted and healed. Okay, I'm, I'm creating a, a, a weird monstrosity. I'm going to stop. Next thing you know, I'll be asking for those bear infantry I was talking about before. Yeah, you can upgrade wolves to bears, that's for sure. Um, the question is, how do you upgrade deer? Because the deer can't kill anything. Deer is your level zero by the infantry, I guess. Well, like, because deer can't kill anything, you can just make, like, a ludicrous upgrade in case a bug ever occurs. So if a deer ever somehow kills something, it just becomes the Sasquatch. It's like a Yeti or something, right? It just randomly evolves into Arceus. There it is. It evolves into Arceus and then changes the entire game into Pokemon. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we've gone off topic here. Because we better focus, because Kazo is trying to get through the walls now. He's got a few spearmen here, plenty of Lombos, which means he's not going to be deterred. Then he will look for access to BC space again. However, BC has put a lot of time. He's now starting to push out the archers with the double blacksmith as well. He's going to get some of these tech ups ready before the fight takes place. And he's going to have a Dao on the river as well, and that's going to be impactful because compared to the fishing ships, that's going to deliver a big punch to those spears, and ultimately the goal here for Beast is to eliminate the spears. Obviously, he needs to be careful not to run into the range of the tower, because the tower does a tremendous amount of damage to combat vessels. As you see, there's just two volleys coming out, and that Dao is half dead. But you're just trying to force back those spears as long as possible by yourself time to build up your archer numbers. Yeah, Dao really is the most poopy of poopy archer ships, isn't it? It's like... I think um, if you had a tier list, all the pros would actually put it as the worst archer ship out of all of them. And you're kind of seeing why. Like, it has terrible range, has terrible armor, it's helpful, it's not that good. The only thing it's really good at is running away, which is a very situational advantage. Anyway, fight underway. Dao, not really targeting out what needs to. The spears need to be addressed. It does bait the archers into the spears for a moment, but Dao will be sunk. So that's a costly investment for Beastie just down the drain. However, it has bought a little bit of time. Time to build even more of these archers. And remember, because he has that efficient production, he's matching the pace of the Lombos. In fact, he's exceeding it with the, the second archery range. Now pushing out four archers to the two every 30 seconds. And this is where it gets worrying for Kazva. He does at least have a choke point to hold for the moment, but horsemen will move in, and that is a freebie. Bang Ram just gone in the blink of an eye. He's going to be forced away as the Dao scares him off. Spearmen need to garrison. Horsemen are going to chase in. The Spearmen actually need to defend these Lombos. But it looks like Beastie's paranoid. He will be backing up with the Horsemen for the moment. And he's also capping the Sacred Site, or at least he's about to cap the Sacred Site on the right side. So he's leveraging the fact that Kazma's got limited mobility here and he's focusing in the middle. So just one Horseman, that Scholar, should be able to capture that Sacred Site for the time being. And behind that, of course, the eco for Beastie is just an absolute juggernaut. As you said, efficient oh. production is kicking in. Just one stable, one range. Actually, there's a second range now going for him, so he can just flood those archers out. Double blacksmith, though, so he's grabbing all those all-important feudal age upgrades as well. I feel like Kazva's window here is closing. Like, he's getting another ram yeah. going, but this is just taking too much time. Yeah, it's like, you have to think about this logically. Like, the efficient production turns you into the council hall, right? But then you've got two of them. So you're pushing out four archers every time your opponent's pushing out two longbows. It is incredibly oppressive right now for Kazva. Kazva literally has, like, a, a window of, I'd say, two minutes to do something impactful. At which stage, Beastie just escalates past him. Because he's got this fishing eco, which has succeeded. Now he's outproducing you militarily. And he's countering you out quite nicely with this composition. And because it's Lombos versus Archers, if you ever fall back, you're going to lose the Lombos. The Archers can chase you down. And you'll also lose the Ford Racks. And that means your game will be more or less over. And that's exactly why he moves in with the Ram. Trying to get rid of the outpost. Forces the fishing boats away. But Beastie doesn't have to care about this. He's still escalating. If we look at the military side of things, Beastie, the golden 69 number. And meanwhile, Kazva trailing down at 38. And behind this beast, Theos is a sacred site trickling in gold for him. So he can slowly progress towards Castle Age. Obviously, he's focusing his food and wood into making army. But the fact that he's basically not consuming gold and he's got that gold trickle will set him up very nicely if he wants to go into Castle Age. But I feel like first he's going to have to take this fight here because Castle will attempt another crossing, oh. probably last in the game, depending on how this goes. Double batting around this time. One of them is just going to be burnt down in the blink of an eye. The Dow's force you away. You can't even try to protect against the Horseman. Horseman chasing in now into the secondary batting ram. And Kazva just standing it there, forfeiting it. He's trying to get down a secondary outpost, but I don't even know if that's going to be good enough. This count is just so damn high. Beastie will back off for the moment, but you have to question whether Kazva is happy with this. He was hoping maybe he'd be able to bait his opponent underneath the outpost and get a good trade because he just lost 600 wood in the blink of an eye. One unappreciated thing is that 
as we discussed before, the horsemen actually received a bonus damage versus or a bonus damage increase versus siege weapons here with their torches. And that is actually not only relevant against uh, weapons like cannons or mangonels, it's also relevant against rams. So it made it much easier for these horsemen to clean up those otherwise very expensive rams out here. Mm -hmm. And we're just seeing the weakness of England when you're forced into this kind of like choke point and you can't play wide, right? That's one of the downsides of England. You're really strong pushing one point, but you can only push one point. And look how that's affected them. If you look up in the north, you notice in the center, there's only these dows here. Where did the fishing fleet go? BC set up a northern dock. He's been fishing up here. He's still boosting his economy vastly beyond Kazva's, and Kazva can never come up here to address this because if he does, he'll be flooded by horsemen in the center that will head straight for his main base or even just cut off your main army from behind. And behind this, Beastie has both sacred sites, so he technically started the sacred site countdown, but that's not so relevant for us. The bigger thing is that he's coming up to Castle H with the compound of the defender, so he's going to be able to start making those stone fortifications and fortify the river at this point. Yeah, and the crazy part is, like, Beastie wasn't even necessarily efficient about this. I think he could have capped that sacred site possibly, like, two minutes plus before because he had a horseman down there waiting to guard. Uh, but he just didn't care, right? It's just a natural occurrence of the game. Castle Age doesn't need to be rushed. You just need to keep pressure up and defend in feudal. And now he doesn't need to defend anymore, right? It's the dawning of a new age. The Delhi Empire is about to rise. It's with this many troops about to be juiced up and all of these racks being dropped, you have to question if Kazra is about ready to hit the GG and call this a series. Ah, uh, it's, it's gotta be a big question indeed, especially because it looks like now Beastie is crossing the river. He doesn't have the veterancy upgrades just yet, but the moment he grabs that, he's gonna have a massive power spike over here. Also supported by some Daos, and it looks like Kazwa's gonna have to leave the safety of those towers as well. Yeah, march in. Horsemen riding in. They spot the villagers. They'll look to butch them. Instead, they turn on the longbows. Longbow's more important. Archers getting in range, trying to look for the spears. Attack speed is working for Kazwa at the moment, but these spears... Their numbers are depleting fast, and the horsemen looking so healthy. Still over 20 of them ready to ride in even deeper. And this is without the tech ups. The tech ups that will be coming very soon. Kazva might just lose the army before then and end up tapping out, as it looks like it's a clear and emphatic victory in the center of a beastie. And Kazva has no way in hell of getting back in this game. Absolutely no way out there. There is just an absolute slaughter, and Kazva is dropping in military pretty heavily. Here is the GG, and with that, Kazva is out of the N4C qualifiers. Even without those upgrades, Beastie's army just wiped out all his forces from the battlefield. Didn't even look close in the end. So trivial of an effort for Beastie to just overcome Kazva. Kazva, we, we warned against this, right? Like, this tactic, this strategy is very effective against players who aren't familiar with the powers of England. BC is. This guy likes to yell Strail Bora more than most people. He's not going to fall for the same thing that worked for you yesterday against Hoho -Ho Defex. And I think the critical detail comes down to that outpost placement. The outpost placement that is the result of hundreds and hundreds of games played and understood in Age of Empires 4. We talked about the whole idea of dropping him on that site. I want to see that. He actually outsmarts me easily because he says, okay, I can drop it on this side, but I don't need to drop it near the, the outcropping like Pigeon's talking about. I don't need to worry about the crossing. Instead, I'm going to put it in a position between two different fishing points so that anytime longbows come, the superior range doesn't matter because I'll shift the fishing boats to the other side and you have to wiggle your way around the annoying range of my outpost to even try and reach the ships again. That small detail escalates so much of this game. I warned against it. I said Beastie is very, very talented, understands Mongolian Heights inside out. I've seen him play Mongolian Heights more than most players have. And I had a feeling that this was coming and I wasn't too surprised by the outcome in the end. Despite the fact that Kazwa understands England very well, I think he still lacks gaps in his like knowledge when you talk about this higher level play um, where you understand what you're meant to do against Delhi. But when your opponent, the Delhi player, understands what's coming, right? What is the next step? It's kind of that back and forth dance. And, you know, we can talk about how easy a top level player can win a game that is perfect from start to finish. But the, the signs of a great, a truly great player is when you start throwing obstacles in his course, does he trip over or does he jump over them and continue towards the finish line? And that is exactly why Beastie takes this in the end, very decisively 